good morning one and all so we will be starting in one or two minutes hope there will be more attendees joining now so um, just wait for two minutes please
ठीक चलिए मैं ये बंद कर देता हूँ अब फोन गुड मॉर्निंग सर हाँ जी गुड मॉर्निंग कैसे हैं आप सॉरी थोड़ा सा कनेक्टिविटी का इशू था नाउ इट इज रिजॉल्व ओके नो वरी सर सो वेलकम सर एंड वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन सो लेट अस स्टार्ट द प्रोसीडिंग्स एंड आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस आवर फर्स्ट स्पीकर फॉर टुडे सेशन प्रोफेसर सुरेश कुमार शर्मा प्रोफेसर शर्मा आई विल डिलीवर अ टॉक ऑन जेनेटिक एसोसिएशन स्टडीज and uh, he is currently a professor at department of statistics at punjab university chandigarh he has also been ex chair pub chairman and ex coordinator for center for systems biology and bioinformatics for almost 8 years he has a rich teaching and research experience of more than 25 years he is working on various projects including projects with who and icmr and he has published more than 125 research papers in national and international reputed journals he has received various awards including best research award in 2003 by aims new delhi and jacobs wolf wolfowitz awards in 2003 by usa government and shiksha ratan award in 2011 again international scientist award on engineering science and medicine recently in this year in 2021 he has also developed two websites recently that is cancer pdf and this phase so without further delay let us welcome professor suresh kumar sharma and sir now stage is yours okay good morning and welcome to all the participants i would like to first of all pay uh, my sincere thanks to professor santanu chaudhary the director of iit jodhpur and the coordinator of this program dr pankaj yadav the assistant professor at iit jodhpur and also the conveners dilpreet kaur priyanka singh so it is in fact a privilege and honor for me to be a part of this program which is on uh, multi omics data science basically my area of research is biostatistics so i will try to quote the examples from this area only because i also worked in bioinformatics and uh, as per as my knowledge is concerned and i have asked asked from the coordinator also that this is a mixed group so if there is a mixed group obviously i have to stick to the basics so i will stick to the basics right from the beginning this topics i mean the topics which i'll cover will be statistical techniques used in genetic association studies so that will be the topic so straight away let me share the screen and start with the proceedings can i share the screen now just give me a moment hopefully you can see my desktop is it visible if somebody can respond please it will be is this visible my desktop is visible yes sir okay all right just give me a moment all right so this is a faculty development program on multi omics data science and uh, my talk will be on statistical techniques in genetic association studies now some of you might may not be familiar with the terminology of statistics so i will stick to very basics and uh, in the end i'll give you maybe 10 minutes to ask question answers also if you have any problem so this is what i have planned for today's lecture first i'll cover some part of research methodology because in order to carry out any type of research it is important to recognize the nature of variables the type of variables etc so i will just spend 10 minutes on research methodology part then i will also make you understand about the basics of some statistics because if you don't know what is skewness what is kurtosis what are quartiles percentiles deciles then it is difficult to go through the interpretation so some of the basics will also be covered 
and then I'll come to what is called measures of association in terms of different type of correlations, which we are, which are generally used. Like uh, in bioinformatics, we are using Matthews correlation in general social sciences and medical sciences. We make use of Carl Pearson, Spearman's and some other type of correlation, which you may not be aware of. I will discuss all these measures of association today. And then I'll also discuss about the regression. Regression is used for prediction. So I'll discuss two types of uh, regression models. One is called simple and another one is multiple. And then the biggest problem for any type of data analysis comes, whether our data is following a normal distribution or not, then I will also give you some insight into how to check the normality of the data and how to deal with the outliers if they are present in the data. And finally, I will discuss about one of the model, which is called disease prediction model. And uh, then also discuss the odds ratio, risk ratio, sensitivity, specificity, and ROC curve. So this is what I planned for today. And hopefully all these statistical techniques, they are helpful in genetic association studies as well as bioinformatics and uh, biological sciences, medical sciences, and even social sciences. So I will stick to the basics right from the beginning. Hopefully you will not face any problem. Okay, let me start with nature and types of data. If you look at nature of data, any type of data, either it is called a structured data or it is called unstructured data. Now, what do you mean by structured data? Structured data is the one where features can be easily extracted. You can easily come out with certain kind of information. For example, if I give you say height or weight of 100 students, then you can easily compute mean, median, mod, skewness, courtesies, et cetera minimum value, maximum value, all these things can be easily extracted out of the data, right? And most of the time structured data is in the numeric form. But what happens sometimes the data is not in the numeric form, but it is in the form of labels. We, but these labels can be easily convertible into numeric form. For example, look at gender. Now, gender is not numeric as such. It's male and female. It's simply a label. But I can write male as one, female as two. And then go for counting how many times one is appearing means male is appearing how many times two is appearing means female is appearing again features can be easily extracted similarly socioeconomic class can be written as lower class middle class upper class right which can be simply labeled as one two three and go for the counting of this so this this type of data which is earlier not in the numeric form but easily convertible into numeric form it's also covered under structured data. So what is basically structured data? Either it is already in the numeric form, like height, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, which is already in the numeric form, or it can be easily convertible into numeric form. This is what we mean by what is called structured data. Then there is unstructured data. What is unstructured data? Unstructured data is the one which is not easily convertible into numeric form. For example, everybody is using WhatsApp. We are receiving hundreds of messages every day. There are videos, there are pictures, and if at the end of the day, I ask you to convert this entire information into numeric form, I don't think it's easy for everyone, right? So, the, but information is there, they are talking about something. So this kind of data, which is not in the numeric form, but is, it is in the textual form, maybe in the form of videos, pictures also, comes under what is called unstructured data. It is easier to deal with structured data, very difficult to deal with unstructured data, and two of my students from bioinformatics and two from statistics, they have completed their PhD on unstructured data. Without even reading the text, we will come to know what they are talking about. So we have derived certain kind of advanced measures, looking at the applications of artificial intelligence, deep learning, and also uh, the Richlet's integral, some other stuff has been involved to find out what is there in the unstructured data. Now, people also talk about these days, big data, Big data is basically a combination of structured and unstructured data. Now, as far as this workshop is concerned, because I have been asked to stick to the basics, I'll cover only the structured part. And if you look at the any kind of structured data, it is basically of two types. Either it is called categorical data or it's called measurement data. If you look at the structured data. Now, what do you mean by categorical data? Categorical data means your measurements are in terms of categories like gender, I can write male as one, female as two. Socioeconomic class, I can write one, two, three, lower, middle, and upper. Similarly, different colors can be coded. Skin colors can be coded, like one, two, three, four, right? Light, medium, or heavy, and so on. 
So this kind of data is covered under categorical data. Then what is a measurement data? Measurement data means some kind of instrument is being involved in measuring something. For example, you can measure height, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol. All these things require some kind of instrument. But what happens sometimes you don't require an instrument, but still it could be a measurable quantity. For example, to measure age, you don't require an instrument, but age can be measured in years. Then you can add months, even days, minutes, and seconds. So it becomes a measurable quantity. So if you look at the categorical data, these are the examples of categorical data, like hair color could be brown, red, black. I didn't put a white there because people sometimes get depressed. <laughs> Our entire body is made up of four types of nucleotides. They are known as ATGC. You know very well. I can write A as 1, T as 2, G as 3, C as 4. Eye color can be coded as 1, 2, 3, 4. Gender 1, 2. Disease mild, moderate, severe as 1, 2, 3. And genotypes you can write depending upon which one is dominant, which one is recessive. You can write 0, 1, and 2. So all this type of data can be easily convertible into numeric form. And that, that comes under what is called the categorical data. Then measurement data, I have already given you example like cholesterol, height, age. This FPGM value, whenever we conduct this alumina experiment, that entire information comes out in terms of ATGC, the four bases, right? And then there is a method to convert this ATGC into some quantity. And that quantity is basically called FPGM value. FPGM value stands for fragment per kilogram per million. Then number of expressed genes, how many genes are expressed for a particular kind of disease in our body, time to complete a homework assignment. So all this is being covered under what is called measurement data. Now, if you look at any kind of measurement data, it is of two types. Either it is called a discrete measurement data or it is called continuous measurement data. So what is a continuous measurement data like height, weight, cholesterol, all this is comes under continuous. That means they are capable of taking any values in decimals also. But as far as discrete measurement data is concerned, it is capable of taking only uh, certain isolated values, not all values. For example, number of members in a family. It could be three members, five members, seven members, but I cannot say number of members in family is 3.7. It doesn't make any sense. Number of errors in the book, number of students present in the class, so this kind of data is referred to as a discrete measurement data. And continuous means it is capable of taking any values within a certain specified range, right? For example, height can take any value within certain specified range. Say if I fix two and say height between 145 to 170 centimeter, then it can take any value. Height could be 157.5, it could be 157.53 centimeter. You can add third, four decimals depending upon the accuracy of your instruments, all right? So hopefully the difference between the continuous and discrete is clear to you. Now, this is something important because if you are using any of the softwares, whether you are using SPSS or SAR, you have to be have a complete clarity about these scales. Unless or otherwise you are not clear about these scales, it is difficult to carry out any type of statistical analysis. So as I mentioned, there are two types of data, categorical data or measurement data and they are on different scales. If you look at the categorical data, it is basically on two different scales. Your categorical data could be on a nominal scale or it could be on an ordinal scale. Remember, please. And also the measurement data is also in terms of two different scales, either on interval or on ratio. Now, if you look at the categorical data, there are two scales, nominal and ordinal. Now, first of all, I'll cover the two scales under categorical data. Then I'll also cover the two scales for measurement data. And the knowledge of these scales, as I mentioned, is very, very, very important. So look at the first of all, the nominal and ordinal for categorical data. So I'm referring to the categorical data nominal scale. What is a nominal scale? A type of categorical data in which objects fall into unordered categories. What does this mean? That means you cannot order the categories that this is lowest and this is highest. For example, if I'm looking at gender, I can write male as one, female as two. Similarly, or you can write female as one, male as two, doesn't make any difference. It is simply a label. I cannot order them that this will come first and this will come later. So the bottom line is, if there is no preference of one category over the other, means all the categories are given equal weightage. All the categories are given equal weightage. 
then we say that our data belongs to the nominal scale. For example, gender, nominal scale. Religion, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Sikh Christian, everybody is human being, right? So they are given equal weightage. So all this kind of data comes under what is called the nominal scale. Again, these are the examples of nominal scale. Your gender, hair color, where do you live? So all these are examples of nominal scale. Then comes what is called the ordinal scale. Comes under again the categorical data. And the difference between nominal and ordinal is very simple. In case of ordinal scale, you can arrange the categories either in ascending or descending order of magnitude. Descending or ascending order of magnitude. For example, if I'm looking at the socioeconomic class, say lower class, middle class and upper class. So lower means the lower income group, upper means the higher income group. So I can, if I'm writing one, two, three, they can be arranged in order. Either one, two, three, one means the lowest, three means the highest, right? Similarly, you can have other categories also, which can be put into order. For example, education categories, say primary school, middle school, high school, graduate, postgraduate, all these categories can be arranged in order, either ascending or descending in order of magnitude. That is the only difference between ordinal. That's why the name comes order. Here order becomes important, which is not possible in nominal scale. But the important point is whether you are dealing with the nominal scale, whether you are dealing with the ordinal scale, the numerical distance between any two categories does not have any significance at all. For example, if I'm writing male as one, female as two, and subtract two minus one, it doesn't have any meaning. Similarly, if I'm writing lower class as one, middle class as two, upper class as three, and subtract three minus one or three minus two, it doesn't have any significance at all. So remember, whether, whether you are dealing with the nominal scale or ordinal scale, the numerical distance between any two categories does not have any significance at all. All right, these are examples of ordinal scale. How do you feel today? So this is the second day of the workshop and I am delivering the first lecture. So I can very well imagine how do you feel today? So very unhappy, right up to very happy. So if you are okay and above, then there is no problem. If you are below that, obviously, uh, may be a problem not for you, but for me. <laughs> How satisfied are you with our services? So at the end of the entire program, you will be given some feedback pro forma. Your questions may be a very unsatisfied to very satisfied. The idea here is you can arrange the categories in order. For example, very unhappy is lowest category. Very happy is the highest category. You can arrange the category data in order. So that is called the ordinal scale. Right, very unsatisfied to very satisfied. So if you have looked into the data of the five point Likert scale or the seven point or the 10 point, now you can very well imagine that this type of data belongs to the ordinal scale. Okay, that's all about the categorical data. Now we come to what is called the measurement data and measurement data also in terms of two different scale. One is called the interval scale. Other one is called the ratio scale. Now in interval scale, Let's look at the first one, interval scale. In interval scale, mathematical operations sometimes are not valid. There are many types of data where mathematical operations are not valid. Let me give you an example. Let's say some beauty contest is going on and there are judges, say, giving score out of 10. Let's say first person gets a score of 8 out of 10 and second one gets a score of 4 out of 10. Now, if I divide 8 by 4, your answer will be 2. But I cannot make a statement that the person whose score is 8 is exactly twice the beautiful than the person whose score is 4. I cannot make such type of statements. Right? Let's say one student has scored 90 marks in a test. Another student has scored 30 marks in a test. Divide 90 by 30, answer will be 3. But I cannot make a statement that the student whose score is 90 is double the intelligent Right, then the, then, then the student whose score is or three times the intelligent than the student whose score is 30. I cannot make such type of statements. Right, so this kind of data where mathematical operations are not valid comes under what is called the interval scale. And the most important point in interval scale is zero. Here the zero does not mean the absence of character. 
zero has a meaning. Zero means some quantity is existent. For example, if I say temperature zero, it does not mean the temperature is absent. It is still better than minus five. So zero has a meaning. Similarly, if, if I say somebody has scored zero in a test, it does not mean the person is not intelligent at all. Maybe on a particular day, his or her performance is not up to the mark. Next time he or she can score better. So all this type of data like temperature, beauty score, intelligence score, they come under what is called the interval scale, right? So, but it is for the measurement data because score is a measurement, temperature is a measurement. Remember this thing. And to overcome all such difficulties, then there is a highest rating scale and that is called the ratio scale. Where all mathematical operations are valid, but you have to be particularly look at zero. Here, zero means the quantity is non existent. So, for example, somebody is having weight 90 kg, another person is having weight 45 kg. Divide 90 by 45, answer will be 2. But I can always make a statement that the person whose weight is 90 kg is double the weight of the person whose weight is 45 kg. Nothing wrong with that. So, you can divide, you can multiply, all these things are possible. But look at zero. If I say weight zero, it is non existent. If I say height zero, it is non existent. A zero, it is non existent. While zero has a meaning in interval scale, it doesn't have meaning in ratio scale. So, this is what you have. So, somebody asked me that this is my variable. Will it go to the ratio scale or will it go to the interval scale? So, look at zero. If zero has a meaning for that particular variable, it will go to the interval scale. If zero doesn't have meaning, it will go to ratio, ratio scale. As simple as that. Sometimes we say that the age of the father is three times the age of the son. If father is 45, son is 15 years. So it is three times, nothing wrong with that. You can multiply, you can divide, all these things are possible in ratio kind of scale. So hopefully clarity about these scales is important because whenever we subject our data for any type of statistical analysis, it will ask you, many of these packages, they ask you, your data is on which type of scale. So there are two scales for categorical data, which are the two scales, nominal and ordinal. And there are two other scales for measurement data. These scales are the interval scale and ratio scale. So this is what I discussed so far. Let's move on. This is the part of the research methodology. Now, if you look at the summary of different kind of scales, here I have put in all the four scales, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. Generally, people are involved in counting also. The counting is possible in all the four scales. That is called frequency distribution. For example, in nominal, I can count how many males are, how many females are there. In ordinal, I can go for how many people belong to the lower class, middle class, upper class, ordinal. In interval and ratio, I can divide my data into small, small intervals, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and go for counting. So counting is possible in all the four scales. Then how do we compute median? We arrange the data in order from the lowest to the highest and look at the middlemost value. But do you think it is possible to arrange the data in order in nominal scale? Not possible. But it is possible in ordinal interval and ratio. So that is possible. Order of the values is known that this is lowest and this is highest. So order of the values is known in ordinal interval and ratio, but not in nominal. Can quantify the difference. Different sets, etc. That doesn't make any sense in nominal as well as in ordinal, but it makes sense in interval and ratio. Can add or subtract interval and ratio, both are possible. Can multiply or divide only under ratio. Have a true zero. True zero means zero means non existent of the quantity only in ratio scale. So, this is the summary of different kind of scales, which we also need to understand. Now, here is something important. Sometimes we are dealing with the same variable, but it can be put into different scales. Question is, how do you measure? Let's look at education as a variable. Now, education can be measured from different point of view. For example, type of education. Then you can have the level of education. You can have the number of years of education. So the way you measure will determine the scale. For example, if the variable education is measured in terms of type of education, such as private or public. Now, some people prefer private, some prefer public. It is individual choice. So your data for education will go to the nominal scale. And it will, it will go to the ordinal scale when measured by the level of education. Primary school, 
high school, college, graduate, postgraduate. So these categories can be raised in order. So again, the same variable education can go to the ordinal scale. And if you go to US or any other country, they will ask you about the number of years of education, 10 years of education, 15 years of education, five years of education, and the same variable can be put into interval scale, right? So question is, the way you measure your variable will determine the scale. It is not that for education, the scale is fixed. No, not at all. It depends upon how you have measured your education variable. Then, then and only then I can comment upon the type of the scale. So this is something important. Why I discuss all this? Because entire, entire statistical analysis depends upon the knowledge of these scales. Sometimes we are dealing with some kind of questionnaires which, is, which deals with the categorical data on the questions are of yes, no type. Right. So the statistical techniques will be totally different if your data is only dealing with categorical. Then sometimes we deal with the measurement data. For example, anthropology people, they deal with the measurement kind of data like height, weight, blood pressure, BMI, skin for thickness, chest measurement. So entire data is concerned with the measurements. Then the statistical techniques will be different. So there are different statistical techniques if you are dealing with categorical data. There are different statistical techniques if you're dealing with the measurement data. And sometimes we have, we have to deal with the mixture of the two. Some part is maybe categorical, some part may be a measurable quantity. For example, if somebody is designing a health questionnaire, some questions may be of categorical type. For example, gender, categorical, right? Then socioeconomic status, lower, middle, upper. Then it is also categorical or maybe marital status, married, unmarried, widow, etc. So that is also categorical. Then you can have uh, occupation categories. They are also categorical. And there could be some measurable data like, say, height, weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. Now you want to correlate the categorical data with the measurement data. So here, what is called the mixture of the two, right? So we will discuss all these techniques today while measuring the discussing about the genetic association studies. So I'm just covering the basics right now. Okay. Now, when people deal with the categorical type of data, they generally compute percentages or proportions most of the time, or they draw bar diagram, pie, pie charts, etc. Please remember these diagram or charts, they are always meant for categorical type of data. You cannot draw them for continuous type of data unless you convert your continuous data into categories, then it is possible. Otherwise not, right? So there is a difference between diagram and graph. Let me just repeat. There is a difference between diagram and graph. What is a diagram? I'm not writing this as bar graph. In most of the books, in many books, substandard books, people write bar graph also, which is absolutely wrong terminology. Because diagram stands for if there is no proper scale on x-axis or y-axis. One of the scale is missing, either on x-axis or y-axis, then it is a diagram. If there is a proper scale on x-axis, proper scale on y-axis, then it is called a graph. For example, if I am writing, let's say, percentage of male and female. So on x-axis, I'll make a rectangle, say male, and then rec another rectangle for female. And on Y axis, I'll be having a proper scale percentages, say 60% male, 40% female, right? Something like that. So, but what is there on X axis? It is simply a label male and female. There is no proper scale on X axis. Then it becomes a diagram. But suppose let me plot height and weight, say height along X axis, weight along Y axis. So there is a proper scale for height, proper scale for weight. Then it is called a graph, right? And most of the time, whenever we deal with the categorical type of data, we draw diagrams, pie, cha, pie diagram or bar diagram. And whenever we deal with the continuous type of data, we look at histogram, we look at box plot, quantile plot, probability plot, all these are possible for continuous type of data. Okay. And here is something important. Whenever people deal with the categorical data, in fact, one can perform all type of statistical analysis including correlation. Even if you are dealing with categorical data, there are different types of correlations which you can use, like tetra correlation, bi serial correlation, point bi serial correlation, gamma coefficient, phi coefficient, coefficient of uncertainty. All these 
correlations are meant for whenever we deal with the categorical type of data. All regression types are possible, like probit regression, logistic regression, logic regression. They can capture your categorical data as well as measurement kind of data. Statistical modeling techniques are possible. Even analysis of variance, etc. They are available for categorical data, but they are known as crucial wall stats. They are known as Friedman test. People are not much aware of those kind of techniques, which I'll discuss today. Okay. So, and when people deal with the measurement kind of data, they have a lot of choices. They have a lot of choices. We can compute mean, standard deviation, median, mod, lowest value, highest value, right? And then we can also draw histogram and box plot. Please remember histogram and box plot, they are always for continuous type of data, not for the categorical data. And look at the last paragraph. In fact, one can perform all type of parametric and non-parametric procedures on measurement data, depending upon the assumptions. So, if your data satisfies certain set of assumptions, like normality, independence, etc., we can apply parametric test. If they are not satisfied by your data, then we have to go for the known parametric test, right? Okay. So, I, I may not be able to cover parametric and non-parametric because it is about the some association measures. But at least you should know what we mean by parametric. And parametric means if your data satisfies certain set of assumptions, the main assumption is of normality. And today I will discuss about normality. You can apply parametric test if it is satisfied. If it is not, let's say data doesn't follow normal, then we have to go for the known parametric test. All right. Now, before coming to the association measures, uh, in five, 10 minutes, let me stick to certain basics, because as I mentioned, if you don't have the idea about where to use, which one, I will not give you any formula because these are certain basics, basics of statistics. And then I'll move on. Right now, why it is called descriptive statistics? Because we want to, we want to describe the features present in our data. Let's say if I give you a basket with hundred oranges. And I asked you to comment something on this. Somebody can look at that. They are, they are of different sizes. Their shapes are different. Somebody can say there are different colors. Some are more yellow. Some are green. Some are in between. What you're trying to do basically. You are trying to describe. The features of oranges, but it is just 100 oranges in a basket. Suppose I give you 5000 observations. Suppose I give you 50,000 observations and whenever we come across genetic data. It involves lakhs of observations. Now you cannot describe such type of information just looking at the data. That's why we need descriptive statistics. We need to look at some mathematical measures which can describe your data. And the simplest out of them is called measures of center tendency. And there are basically three measures of center tendency. One of them is called mean, another is called median, another is called mod. Now, how do we compute mean? Everybody knows we add all the observation divided by the number of observations. You will get the value of the mean. But there are certain problems with mean. Let me discuss this, this problem. Let's say I give you a population data from 1981 to 1990, 10 years of data, 81 to 90. 81 is included. So you will having 10 years of data. So all population values are given. And I ask you to compute mean. So you will add all the 10 values divided by 10, you will get your answer. Absolutely right. But suppose 88, 1988 population is missing. There is a question mark. All other values are known to you for the population data except 1988. And I ask you to compute mean. Now you can compute mean of nine observations, but I am asking to compute mean of 10 observations. 88 is missing, so you cannot compute. So if there are missing values present in your data, the mean cannot be computed. But look at the other type of scenario. Suppose most of the data, let's say, let's say systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is around 120. Diastolic is around 80, right? So it is 80 to 120. Suppose, let's say systolic blood pressure. Suppose, depending upon age, it's 90 plus age generally, the blood pressure. So suppose your maximum data is between. 120 to 140. 
99% of the observations, they are between 120 to 140. So your mean will also be come out, come out in between 120 to 140, maybe around 130, 132, depending upon the nature of the data. But it will be certainly between 120 to 140. But suppose one observation is 280. Somebody's blood pressure has shoot up to 280. Now nothing wrong with that. If you include this observation into also into computation of mean, your entire mean may shift to 170. While most of the observation, they are between 120 to 140. Do you think mean is representing your data? I think you will agree with me. Not at all. Because of the one observation, it has shifted. So mean doesn't sometimes make sense whenever there are missing observations, when there are outliers present in the data. And today I'll also discuss how to identify outliers present in the data. Right? So, and how to deal with outliers. So mean doesn't make sense. If there are missing values, if there are outliers present in the data, that's why we look at median. Now, even if one observation is 280, I arrange the entire data of 120 to 140. Most of the observations are there into ascending order, let's say, or descending order and look at the middlemost value. So median will definitely be come out between somewhere between middlemost value will be coming out between 120 to 140. So median makes sense. Similarly, in population data, you can see. Let's say I arrange the data in order from the lowest to the highest. 88 is missing, but I know that population is most of the time in increasing, particularly in India, it will never decrease. So with the assumption that 88 population will be higher than 87, 89 will be higher than 88. So I can arrange them in order and look at the middlemost value like 85. So median will make sense rather than mean. So you have to be very careful which statistical measure makes sense, whether it is mean or median. Right. And what is mod? Mod is nothing but look at this simple data. 154555. And this is the definition of mod, the most frequently occurring values among the set of observations. So here if anybody can see that five is occurring maximum number of times. One, two, three, four, five. So uh, your answer will be mod is five. Because the definition of mod says the most frequently occurring value. Okay. Now, let me change this data a little bit. Here, 5 is occurring 5 times. Let, let me say 7 is also occurring 5 times. 7 is also occurring 5 times. Now, 5 is occurring 5 times and 7 is also occurring 5 times. My question is, what is the value of mod? Some of you may say that it is 5 plus 7 divided by 2. Answer is 6. Let me tell you, this is absolutely wrong. Because what is the definition? The most frequently occurring value. Six is not the most frequently occurring value in your data. It doesn't appear even once. So six cannot be mod. So what is the answer? If there are two equally repeated values, like five is occurring five times, seven is occurring five times. So there will be two values of mod. One is five, another is seven. Remember, mean value is always one. Median value is always one but mod may not be unique. So there are two mods for this data, five and seven. If you have two mods in your data, this is called bimodal distribution. If you have more than two mods in your data, this is called multi-model distribution, right? And if there is only one mod, then this is called unimodal distribution. So your distribution may be unimodal, bimodal, or maybe multi-mod. Now, another, another situation for mod, Let's say every value is repeated once. Two is occurring once, five is occurring once, seven is occurring once, four, three. So whatever the values, they are occurring one time. My question is, what is the value of mod? Some of you may answer that all the values are mod. But look at the definition. Most frequently occurring value. There is no most frequently occurring values in, in your data. If there is no, the mod will not exist. Correct answer is mod will not exist because there is no most frequently occurring value right so you have to be careful where to use mod where to use mean where to use median now once we know mean median mod why to look at dispersion or variability why to look at dispersion or variability right look at series one data i'm taking a very small data set series one data and series two data if you add this data some will be 45 
some will also be 45 here right there are five observations in this five observations in this and how do we compute mean sum divided by the number so 45 divided by 5 is 9 45 divided by 5 is 9 okay now let let's do one exercise i'll not show you the data let's say i'll not show you the data my question is if mean of five observation is nine question is can you make out whether it is series one data or series two data i don't think anybody can make out because i have not shown you the data i'm simply posing the question that mean of five observation is nine and question is whether it is it has come from series one or it has come from series two it may be series one it may be series two what does this mean that means mean is not describing your data completely there is something missing and this is this missing part is basically called variability or variation that's why important to becomes to to go through the measures of variation or measures of variability which is known as in broader term dispersion dispersion means scatteredness how the observations are scattered or away from each other for example look at series 1 data it varies from 1 to 17. The lowest value is 1, highest value is 17. So large range. Range is here 16. 17 minus 1, highest minus lowest. But look at series 2 data. Observations are very close. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So obviously anybody can say that here variation is less, here variation is more. But this is just the 5 observations. Let's say I deal with 50,000 observations. I deal with 5 lakh observations. Then I need to look at some kind of mathematical measures that's why we look at measures like range but range is not a very good measure of dispersion because it depends upon only two values then what is the best measure of variation the best measure of variation either it is called a standard deviation and if you scare the standard deviation you will get the variance so variance of standard deviation they are known as the best measures of variation why let me give you a logic behind this. Now, how you must have gone through the formula of variance in your textbooks. And some people say these statistics people, they make very complicated formulas. Let, I'll not go into formula today, but I'll give you a logic behind this. Right? What is the logic of computing variation and how it, it becomes easier to compute? So logic is this. Because mean is generally there in the center, you can see mean is there in the center. So there are a few observations below this and after this. Mean will always be there in the center. Let's do a very simple exercise. So in statistics, any observation is denoted by Xi. Xi stands for ith observation in a series. For example, in, if I look at series 1 and put i is equal to 1, so that means I am representing the first observation. So x1 is 1, x2 is 5 x3 is 9 and so on. Similarly, mean in statistics is denoted by x bar. So your x bar is 9 here. So that is mean. Let's do a simple exercise for series 1 and series 2. Let me subtract the mean because mean is there in the center. So let me subtract the mean xi minus x bar. So your x bar is 9. All these are xi's. So your series 1, 1 minus 9, so minus 8. 5 minus 9, minus 4, 9 minus 9, 0, 13 minus 9, 4, 17 minus 9, 8, right? Same thing for series 2, 7 minus 9, minus 2, then minus 1, 0, 1 and 2. Now, what are you able to get? I able to convert into the central part, basically. That's why I subtracted the mean. And, and if you are measuring something around center, then it becomes easier. So measurement in terms of 0 is always easier. So your diagram will look like this. Let's say 0 is here. So series 1, what is the range of series 1? From minus 1, minus 8 to 8. Look at the difference. And the range of series 2 is minus 2 to 2. And 0 is in both the cases, 0 is in the center. So, so what you can say? If your values are closer to 0, for example, series 2, the range is only from minus 2 to 2, then the dispersion will be less. And if values are far away from 0, let's say series 1, it varies from minus 8 to plus 8. You can check minus 8 to plus 8. And if they are far away from 0, variation will be more. So looking at a simple plot, you will come to know which series is having more variation. 
which series is having less variation. But people in medical sciences, biological sciences, they are afraid of negative sign. Our data was positive. How come it is coming out to be negative, right? They don't understand the transformation of scale. Then these statistics people are very smart. Then let's say let's simplify this thing also. Let's let me just take the square. I convert all the negative values to positive. How they can be converted? If you take the square, you will get positive. So let me square this quantity. So minus eight square sixty four minus four square sixteen zero four this and this. Similarly here minus two square four this and this. But nothing has happened. We just able to get rid of the negative sign. Let's go one step ahead. Let me take the sum. Sum of this. Sum means addition of all the numbers. So if I take the sum of all the five values, your sum will be 64 plus 64, 128 plus 16, 144 plus 16, 160. So your sum is coming out to be 160. Let's do the same exercise for series two. Take the sum. Sum is 4 plus 4, 8 plus 9 plus 10. So it is coming out to be 10. Now you are you are arriving at some mathematical form that wherever this sum is more, the dispersion will be more. Wherever this sum is less, dispersion will be less, right? But the problem here is we have in series one five observation, in series two five observation. So no problem. But suppose in series one, in series one, suppose you have, let's say. In series one, you have 100 observations. And in series two, you have 20 observations. So where there are more observations, this sum will be more. Where there are less number of observations, sum will be less. So you cannot compare in terms of sum, right? So that's why we divide by the corresponding number to get an average, right? So if I divide this by N, so average, whether it's, let's say in one section, you have 100 students, in another, another section, you have 20 students and I'm just looking at the average. So in first case, you add 100 divided by 100. In second case, you take the sum of 20 divided by 20 and you will see averages will almost be same. So if you divide by 1 over n, so 160 divided by n is 5. So 160 divided by 5 is 32. And here also you do the same thing. 10 divided by 5 will be 2. And what is this actually? This is the formula which you have learned in your 11th standard, 12th standard. And that was the formula for variance, but we able to cram it. We never realized how it is coming. It is coming from the basic logic. Actually, you take the deviations from mean to get rid of the negative sign square and take the average where this average is going to be less. Dispersion will be less where this average is going to be more dispersion will be more as simple as that. And this is called the mathematical formula for variance. This is what we have learned. Variance. Right. Okay, that is the logic behind variance and variance can see which variation, which series is having more variation, whether series one or series two. Just look at variation. It depends upon all the observation, right? Okay, now whenever we take the power two, here the power is two, then this is called in statistics second order moment. What we call second order moment. If I raise this power 3, then this will come to M3, which is called third order moment. If I raise this power 4, then I call this as M4, which is called fourth order moment. And the second order moment, which is M2, third order moment, which is M3, and the fourth order moment, which is M4, they are helpful in computations of the another measures, which are known as skewness and kurtosis. And they will help you to know whether your data is normally distributed or not normally distributed, right? Now, once we know the variation, why to look at standard deviation? Again, there is a logic and the logic is here. Let's say I'm giving, I have been given height in centimeters and I take the mean of this. So mean means you add all the height values divided by the number, which is constant. So you are answer to mean will be in terms of centimeter. Units of mean will also be centimeter. But when we compute variance, it is a square. So if it is relating to height in centimeters, so your units of variance will come out to be centimeter square. And I cannot add mean plus minus variance because mean is in centimeter. 
variance is centimeter square. I cannot add or I cannot subtract. That's why we compute standard deviation. Now, so what is the standard deviation? Under root of variance. If I take under root of centimeter square, it will come back to centimeter. So that's why standard deviation makes sense. So mean and standard deviation, they are in the same units. That's why we take under root of variance, right? Then sometimes we also need to look at coefficient of variation, which is generally used in bioinformatics studies, biological studies. Now, once we know standard deviation, once we know the mean, why to compute coefficient of variation? Let me look at a simple example. Let's say there is one series which is corresponding to height and the data is in centimeters. And there is another series of the same persons which is corresponding to weight and weight is given in kg. And somebody is asking me a question whether his height is having more variation or weight is having more variation. Now, even if you compute standard deviation or variance, one of the answer will come out to be in centimeter. Another answer will come out to be in kg. And I cannot compare kg with the centimeter. That's why if the series are measured in different units, we go one step ahead to describe which one is more homogeneous, which one is heterogeneous. We compute what is called coefficient of variation. So coefficient of variation makes sense when we want to compare series two or more series which are measured in different units let me just repeat coefficient of variation makes sense when two or, we want to compare two or more series which are measured in different units let's say first of all i compute the coefficient of variation of height height is measured in centimeter so i'll compute standard deviation the units for standard deviation will be centimeter i'll also compute the mean of the height that is also centimeter and then divide sigma by x bar so centimeter and centimeter will get cancelled multiply by 100 will give you percentage suppose the coefficient of variation for height is coming out to be 27 percent suppose for any data then i look at the weight now i compute the standard deviation of weight i also compute the mean of weight divide again multiply by 100 and suppose the weight coefficient of variation is coming out to be 17 percent now for height it is coming out to be 27 percent for weight it is 17 percent now it's free from units of measurement i can say that height is having more variation as compared to weight right so i can compare the units which are measured in different units that's why the coefficient of variation importance is there then if we divide the data into two equal parts that is called median if I divide the data into four equal parts, they are known as quartiles. So generally there are three quartiles, Q1, Q2 and Q3. Q1 is called the first quartile. First quartile means 25% of the observations are below or equal to this point and 75% above this point. Q2 is basically correspond to median because it is there in the center. And Q3 means it is just opposite of Q1. Here 25% less, here 75% less and 25% more. So we generally compute Q1, Q2, etc. to divide the data into four equal parts. You need three cutoff. One of the cutoff is Q1, another is Q2, another is Q3. That divides the data into four equal parts. Deciles divide the data into 10 equal parts. Percentiles divide the data into 100 equal parts. These are called partitioning values. And finally, Skewness and kurtosis. As I mentioned, they play a very important role in order to see whether data is normal or it is not normal. Right? Now, how do we compute? What do we mean by skewness? Skewness means basically lack of symmetry. If you look at the shape of the histogram, let's say I look at the shape of the histogram. And let's say one bar is here in the center, which is the highest bar, three bars on the left hand side and three bars on the right hand side. And if you draw a curve, curve will look like this. So it is almost symmetrical curve. And if you drop a line from the center and area on the left hand side is almost same as the area on the right hand side. If this is the case, then we say that there is no skewness. There is no skewness. And we say that it is almost symmetrical. But suppose your shape of the histogram look like this. Let's say one bar is here. There are three bars on the left hand side. 
but 10 bars on the right hand side, small, 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 small bars on the right hand side. And if you draw a curve, the curve look like this. And if you draw a line from the highest point, area on the left hand side will be less, but area on the right hand side is more. If this is the case, then we say your data is positively skewed. This is positively skewed picture. And if it is other way around, let's say I drop a line from here, area on the right hand side is less, but area on the left hand side is more. Then this is called negatively skewed. Now, how to measure this skewness, whether it is symmetrical, whether it is positive, whether it is negative, we compute measure of skewness and that is given in terms of moments. If you remember, I discussed moments, second order moment is variance. Then we compute third order moment M3, fourth order moment M4. And based on that, we look at skewness. And this is the formula for skewness, M3 square upon M2 cube. What is M3? Third order moment. What is M2? Second order moment. Then compute this factor from the given data. And odd power could be negative. It could be positive also. But once you square the odd power, because M3 is odd, it will always become positive. And variance is always square. So it can never be negative. So basically, an under root, you will always get a positive quantity. But how to assign positive or negative sign? It depends upon the sign of M3. If the sign of M3 is coming out to be negative, then you put negative sign in front of beta 1. If sign of M3 is coming out to be positive, you put a positive sign here. So if beta 1, either it could be negative, it could be positive, or it could be 0. If value of beta 1 is 0, then your graph is symmetrical. If value of beta 1 is positive, greater than 0, positively skewed. If it is less than 0, negatively skewed. Right? So you will come out with this beta 1. Either it will be 0 or it will be less than 0 or greater than 0. So you will come to know whether it is positive, negative, or negatively skewed or it is symmetric. So that is the measurement for skewness. The last measure is called what is called kurtosis. The kurtosis measure the peakedness of the curve. For example, there are three curves here. If you drop a line from the highest point, area on the left and right, they are approximately same. Now do the same thing here. Drop a line from the highest point. Area on the left and right are again same. And if you drop a line again from the center, areas are same on the left and right. So three pictures, you can say there is hardly any skewness. Skewness is zero. That means they are symmetrical. Right? But look at the shapes. This shape is different from this one. Right? So that means skewness alone cannot determine the shape. Okay? You have to look at the another measure which is called kurtosis. And kurtosis deals with the peakedness. How peak it is, how flatter it is, will be determined by kurtosis. And there is a formula to compute kurtosis, which is in terms of beta 2, fourth order moment, divided by square of second order moments, minus 3. Again, it will come out to be 0. If the value of beta 2 is coming out to be 0, then your curve is neither peaked nor flattened. It's a normal curve. This is a normal curve. So in this case, your beta 2 will be 0. And this type of curve is called a mesocurtic curve or normal curve. Definition comes from here. But if value of beta 2 is greater than 0, you see it is coming out to be 3.4, that means your data is having high peak. I peak means this type of curve, beta 2 greater than 0. And this curve is called leptocurtic curve. And if value of beta 2 is less than 0, it is a flatter curve. It is called platycurtic curve. Right? So this skewedness and kurtosis help you to determine whether your data is normally distributed or not. not. You can note down the rule of thumb. The rule of thumb says, that if value of beta 1 and beta 2, beta 1 is skewness, beta 2 is kurtosis. If value of beta 1 and beta 2, they roughly, they roughly lie between minus 2 to plus 2. Both of them, minus 2 to plus 2. Then your data is approximately normally distributed. But if value of either beta 1 or beta 2 is less than minus 2 or greater than plus 2, then you have, there is a big concern about the normality of your data. So parametric test certainly will not be applicable. You have to apply non-parametric test. So with this background, here is an exercise to you. 
mathematical exercise <laughs> there is a line a there is line b and if you see from your eye anybody can see that line a seems to be smaller than line b right somebody can say the line a is smaller than line b and it looks also if you see from your eye but let's check this is line a this is line b in fact both of them are equal both of them both the lines are equal but when you look from here a looks smaller and b looks bigger what is the difference the difference is because it is closed from both sides and this is open from both sides right the human mind also works with the same logic if you are listening to me with closed mind then that means you are referring to line a and you are if you are listening to me with open mind that means the same thing which i am explaining will look much more bigger you can get much more important information if you listen to me with open mind so that is the idea behind this diagram to show you so my request is listen to me with open mind so that i can clarify some of your doubts so this covers all basics of statistics now i'll come to your next topic which is about correlation regression and i'll discuss one of the model which is about disease prediction model okay now what do you mean by correlation correlation means just to look at the relationship between two or more variables if it is between two variables then this is called simple correlation if it is between more than two variables then the terminology used is multiple correlation so here is the first i'll try to cover correlation so there are different type of correlations and some of the correlations which i'll discuss they may not you may not be aware of but these you already know so simplest type of correlation is the carl pearson's correlation coefficient which is used in many of the sciences but remember there are certain restrictions on carl pearson's correlation coefficient where to be used so it is used under following conditions number one both y and x variables they should be measurable quantities that's the first restriction if there is one of them is categorical you cannot compute carl pearson's correlation coefficient both of them they should be measurable quantities they should be metric variables number one number two there should be a linear relationship between y and x if i plot x along x axis y along y axis points must be along a straight line this is what do you mean by linear so if points are along a straight line both of them they are measurable quantities then we apply carl pearson's correlation coefficient for example carl pearson correlation coefficient between height and weight age and blood pressure in such type of situation you can compute carl pearson's correlation coefficient which is denoted by small r and its value can vary from minus 1 to plus 1 the minimum minus 1 maximum 1 if value is closer to 0 so there is no correlation if value is closer to 1 positive correlation value is closer to minus 1 negative correlation then there is another type of correlation spearman's rank correlation now we discuss about the categorical data five point scale seven point scale if your data is already in the form of ranks from the lowest to the highest then you cannot compute carl pearson's correlation coefficient if the data is already in the form of rank that's why the name comes in rank correlation see on a five point scale on a four point scale on a seven point scale from the lowest to the highest value strongly disagree to strongly agree say anxiety is measured on five point scale depression is measured on five point scale right and you want to correlate between them do not apply carl pearson because it's a ranking data now apply spearman's rank correlation so if the it is in the form of ranks straight away apply spearman's rank correlation its limits is also from minus one to plus one same interpretation as carl pearson or another situation is if data both of them are norm both of them are measurable quantities but you look at the shape of y and shape of x and it is not symmetrical that means it is not following normal distribution in that case even you should not compute carl pearson correlation coefficient for a non normal data you must compute spearman's rank correlation so automatically your data will be converted to ranks and you will get the answer so these type of correlations spearman's and rank where to use i think i have clarified for example in i'm just looking at correlation between intelligence and beauty 
where beauty is measured on five point scale, scale intelligence is also let's say measured on five point scale. So I'll set up apply Spearman's rather than Carpiasen. Okay, but these two involve only two variables y and x. But sometimes there are more number of variables. Let's say there is one variable which depends upon number of factors. Let's say blood pressure of a patient depends upon number of factors. It may depend upon his eating habits. It may be whether person is a vegetarian, non-vegetarian. It may also depend upon the smoking, how many cigarettes person is taking per day. It may also depend upon the body surface area, whether a person is uh, a weak person or a very fat person. It depends upon number of factors, right? If this is the case, that one variable depends upon number of factors, then we use what is called a multiple correlation coefficient. Let's say IQ, IQ of a person depends upon mental age. It may depend upon the, let's say, convolution score. It may depend upon personality. It may depend upon number of factors, right? So if this is the situation, then we use multiple correlation coefficient, which is denoted by R here. And its value lies between its value always lies between 0 to 1 because here can never be negative. So why Carl Pearson and Spearman, they take value minus 1 to plus 1, but this value always take between 0 and 1 because square can never be negative. Then there is another type of correlation which is called partial correlation. This is of very much of importance. People ignore this. Let's say somebody is having age data and blood pressure. Right. Now, I plot age on x axis, blood pressure on y axis, and there is a linear trend. So I compute Carl Pearson's correlation coefficient because age is a measurement, blood pressure is a measurement, and give my answer that there is a positive correlation between age and blood pressure. If age is increasing, blood pressure is increasing, and significant correlation. And I am making presentation in front of the doctors. And one of the doctors asked, asked me this question that, whether there were smokers and non-smokers also in your data. Now, I didn't check whether there were smokers or non-smokers in my data. And clinically, it is tested that those who are smokers, they are likely to have slightly higher blood pressure as compared to those who are non-smokers. Now, whatever the correlation you are getting, it may be effect of the third variable, which is smoking, which you have completely ignored. So, in such type of situation, if there is some other factor, which can impact the relationship between the two, we compute what is called partial correlation. So basically we compute correlation again between two variables like age and blood pressure, but by controlling the effect of smoking, right? By controlling the effect of smoking, then we use what is called partial correlation. Then there is correlation ratio. Correlation ratio is the points are not along a straight line, points are along a curve, then we compute what is called Curvy linear relationship, and that is in terms of correlation ratio. And if nothing is specific, which type of correlation is likely to be there, you cannot see from your eye whether the trend is increasing, decreasing. Then there are another branch of statistics which can handle what is called a non-linear type of correlations. So here is a picture. If this is points are increasing, height versus weight. I can compute Carl Pearson's correlation coefficient. But points are increasing, so there will be a positive correlation. Here points are decreasing, negative correlation. But look at this diagram correlation between blood pressure and hemoglobin. Clinically also, there is no relationship between blood pressure and hemoglobin. I cannot say those people who are having high blood pressure, they are will be having low hemoglobin level, nothing like that. So nothing is visible from here. So I can only rule out the possibility that there is no linear relationship between the two variables. But there could be other relationship, like curvilinear. They are being tested with the help of what is called no linear correlations. Okay, now these are not the only type of correlations which are measured, in, which are measured, uh, which are used in genetic association studies. Now I'll discuss something about in next five six minutes, the measure of different kind of association in genetic studies, particularly. Let's say I will also discuss about this categorical data and measurement data. Categorical data involving two scales, nominal and ordinal. Measurement data, interval and ratio. You remember that, right? Now, if your data is nominal by nominal. One variable is nominal, another is also nominal. Then which type of correlations to be computed? I cannot compute Carl Pearson. I cannot compute Spearman's. I cannot compute correlation ratio, multiple, nothing is, nothing can be computed. 
So what type of correlations are needed? For example, example of nominal by nominal, say on one side you have gender, which is nominal. Another, another on the other side you have blood groups, O, O positive, A, A positive and so on. I want to core, I want to find out the relationship between blood types and the gender, right? So it's nominal by nominal. So these are the correlations to be computed. Contingency coefficient, phi and Kramer's V lambda, uncertainty coefficient. And out of this uncertainty coefficient is the best one. And if your data is ordinal by ordinal, let's say one, one variable is ordinal, severity of disease, mild, moderate, severe. And on the other side, you have the age categories, say 20 to 30 years, 30 to 40 years, and greater than 40 years. Younger people, older people, that is also ordinal. I want to compute, is there any relationship between age and severity of disease? Ordinal by ordinal. So, which type of correlations to be computed? The best one, there is a gamma coefficient, Sommers, D, Candles, gamma is the best one, right? And if it is nominal by ordinal, one variable is nominal, like gender, another is ordinal, like blood pressure, sorry, ordinal, nominal by ordinal, that means uh, you can have nominal by ordinal, say nominal is gender, severity of disease, mild, moderate, severe, so that is ordinal. Then we compute chi-scale. Then nominal by interval. One variable is nominal, another is interval. It's a measurement. Then which type of correlations to be computed? Eta, Mcnima, risk, kappa. So out of this, eta is the best coefficient to be computed. So here are a few examples. Nominal by nominal. You have gender versus blood types. You compute uncertainty coefficient. Then ordinal by ordinal. Like parental age versus risk of disease, paternal age versus risk of disease. You generally we compute gamma coefficient. Nominal by ordinal, AMD, AMD stands for age related macular degeneration versus risk of disease. Risk of disease mild, moderate, severe. So high, low, or very high, severe. So you can write AMD is yes and no type. Risk of disease is mild, moderate, severe, chi scale. Then nominal by interval ratio. Ethnic origin is nominal, Asian, African, and so on, versus amount of lactase produced in the intestine. That is a measurable quantity. So then we use kappa, eta, eta coefficient is best out of this. And when we have ratio by ratio, you can compute Carl Pearson, you can compute Spearman's, partial, all these things are possible, right? Okay, this I have already discussed. And uh, then there is idea of, uh, strong and weak relationship so this is a linear you can see points are increasing this is also linear so i can apply carl pearson's but if this is the shape i cannot apply carl pearson's i have to go for correlation ratio or maybe non-linear type of correlations strong and weak relationship if points are very very closed then we say there is a strong relationship if points are far away from each other then there is a weak relationship so this we have discussed for carl pearson's pearman's multiple partial then finally uh, in two minutes i'll discuss about the linear regression model i don't think i have a time to discuss the disease prediction model and then i'll stop regression is used for prediction remember correlation is never used for prediction it's only the regression which is used for prediction correlation just form a part of prediction one part of prediction correlation is never used for prediction Regression is used for prediction. And the model for simple linear regression is if you are dealing with only two variables, say y and x, say y is your dependent variable, which is time since death, TSD. And x is your independent variable, which is sodium potassium ratio present in the body. Right? Then you are developing a model which is based on simple linear regression model that I want to estimate the time since death based on the sodium potassium ratio if sodium potassium ratio declines whether the time since death is increasing or not something like this so for this purpose we use what is called simple linear regression model right and this is the entire uh, notation which we use in simple regression model this is called dependent variable this is called intercept slope independent variable and this is error this is basically errors in measurement and from the given data, we reduce this error to zero by a method of mathematical method that is called method of least years. So we able to estimate 
these parameters beta naught and beta one. So we sub replace by their estimates. Then you will get this type of equation. You will get this type of equation. Now you give any value to x, you can estimate y. You give any value to x, you can estimate y. So this is called a simple linear regression. Then there is a multiple linear regression, which is an extension of simple regression. For example, say IQ depends upon mental age. It may depends upon personality. It may depends upon skill. It may depends upon number of factors. Then we use what is called multiple regression. Again, these coefficients gets estimated from the given data, error reduced to zero. So you will get this type of equation. Now give any value to x1, x2, xk, you can estimate y. Right. And for multiple regression, we, we, we compute multiple correlation. For simple regression, we compute simple correlation. So these are the procedures which we use many times in genetic association studies for prediction and all these things. And how to check the normality of the data? There are three important graphs. You can look at the shape of the histogram. You can look at the shape of the box plot, normal quantile plot, for example. Here, look at the shape of the histogram. The data is not normally distributed because if I drop a line from the center and this is a normal curve, your some boxes are outside this curve. So obviously, this is not a normally distributed. Look at this is approximately normal. And this is a box plot. If median, this would have been right there in the center, data would have been normal. And this is the shape of the quantile plot. And we can identify out, out we can identify outliers with the help of box plot. And if there are multiple outliers present in your data, then we can make use of Mahanal obvious distance to find out multiple outliers present in our data. And in many softwares, they have been discussed. So I don't think I am left with uh, to discuss about the disease prediction model. So I'll stop here. If you have any question, any query, you are most welcome to ask in next two, three minutes. Yes, please, because another speaker is up to deliver at 1130. Yes, please. Any question, any query? Thank you so much, sir. It was very uh, engaging and very lot of learning uh, in this session. So um, I personally learned also many things. So I would request, uh, let me first uh, check with the panelist if there is any um, question from the panelist please right. uh, feel free to ask sir yeah you are most welcome to ask me please if there is any question you can ask me if there is any question in the chat box you can find out please yes so please write your questions in the chat box or you can raise your hand we can promote you to the panelist and you can ask Uh, don't see any question in the chat box so far maybe i think uh, maybe i'm not treated as an outlier because it's a statistics lecture rather than <laughs> me <laughs> so i think the talk was really clear and uh, it was uh, i think most because you asked me to cover the basics so yes, i just covered yes, the basics. it was really good and uh, sir there is one question can you say a few things about survival curves yeah okay survival curve is basically time to event type of curves i mean whenever there is a time to event something has happened then we write this as one right let's say i'm i'm involving uh, with the uh, let's say liver cancer patients and how the liver cancer patients survive in different stages of cancer right now what kind of data I will be having? Let's say this is a person, patients are suffering from liver cancer. When the event will occur, that means when the death has occurred. And before that, I'll, I'll put when that has occurred, I put this as one. When it doesn't have occurs, I put this as zero. That means the person is surviving. Surviving means it is zero. And if death occurs, it is one. So out of, let's say, 100 patients, then I look at how many, how many, how many years this person has survived? I can have either in months or in years. So that is called survival kind of data. So in one time you have a status. Status means what is the status of the patients, either dead or alive. And in another column, I will be having the time of survival, time of survival that this patient survive for five years, this patient survive for eight years, or you can put it into months. Then we draw a survival curve and survival curve will give you an idea that what is the median survival of all the patients? If patients have developed, let's say, stage two type of cancer in liver, what is their survival time? If patients have 
third type of stage, then what is their survival time? And in survival time, we are getting two types of uh, survival curves. One is called based on the hazard ratio. Another is called the survival curve. So they are just opposite of one another. And uh, all the characteristics of the patients can be measured in terms of survival curves. What is the survival after 10 years? What is the survival after 20 years? Or what is the survival after two years? So all these things will be known from the survival curves. So that is the survival curve basically. But I don't have a time to cover that part. Otherwise, I would have covered the survival curve. <laughs> yes, please. Any other question? Thank, thank you, sir. Maybe the last question. When we study a disease and control patients, what should be the size of sample to make valid conclusions? Very important question. See, sample size depends upon if you are looking, if you are having a case and control type of study, right? So, first of all, sample size is not a straightforward question to be answered by me because I need to get information from you. For example, if I am having case and control type of study, and if you tell me what is the prevalence or incidence in the population, which is generally given, let's say diabetes, 10% of the patients are effective or coronary heart disease, 12% of the patients are affected in the population. If you provide me this information, then I'll give you the complete sample size that this is the sample size you require for your study. Similarly, if there is a mean SD type of study, let's say you have some intervention kind of study, say birth weight of the newborn babies without intervention is this much, and I want to raise this to this much, then you do, do some kind of intervention. And if you tell me that 0.5 is significant, if you are raising the birth weight from 2.53 kg after the intervention, then it is significant. If you tell me that this is the figure of 0.5, which I want to improve, then I can give you the sample size. So most of the information has to come from you before computation of the sample size. So last, last to last month, we conducted a workshop on sample size. That was in Ames Delhi, or I delivered three lectures simply on sample size. So you can go through their videos and you can learn more on sample size because it is not possible to cover in five, 10 minutes here. Okay. So maybe the last question by Dr. Gitanjali. Uh, yeah. Dr. Gitanjali, please go ahead. Yes, please. Dr. Gitanjali, ask your question. If it is written in the chat box, then I can. I don't think it is written in the chat box. Audible, sir? Yes, yes. Yes, please ask your question. Sir, first of all, thank you for this wonderful session. Thank you. My question is very basic. Hmm. The slide where you showed the how to picture. How to? Picture B1, the one. Your voice is breaking, actually. I am unable to listen. Can you repeat again? No, sir. So, audible now, sir? Yeah, just repeat. Yeah, so in the slide where you have shown how to measure. Again, your voice is breaking actually. Can you put into chat box? Uh, okay, just repeat please. In that, uh, because of the under root, my, my question is simply very, uh, very simple. For uh, calculating the beta one, uh, because of the under root, uh, the answer would always come in, in, in positive, right sir? Yeah. Then you have to assign negative and negative and positive sign depending upon the sign of M3. If M3, M3 is there, M3 could be negative, it could be positive. If your M3 is coming out to be negative, you assign negative sign in front of the value. If it is positive, you assign positive sign. Irrespective of the under root. Irrespective of the, the under root will always give you a positive value. Let's say your value is coming out to be something like 0.73. And but sign of M3, because sign of M3 you have to compute separately. M3 sign of M3 was negative. Then you will write this beta one as minus 0.73. Okay. Okay. Sir. Yeah. So, and if it is positive, M3 sign of M3 is positive. You put a positive sign in front of that. Okay. Yeah. Good. Any other question? I think uh, there are no no questions. Like maybe the last, sir. Sorry. Uh, what will be the limit value of kurtosis in case of normal distribution? Uh, both for skewness and kurtosis. It is just a rule of thumb that if skewness and kurtosis, they lies between minus 2 to plus 2. Between minus 2 to plus 2, then you should not bother about normality. Your data is approximately normally distributed. But, but if it is below minus 2, 
let's say value is minus three or above plus two, let's say value is 3.5, then certainly your data is not normal. And in that case, you have to go for the known parametric test rather than applying the parametric test. So they are the cutoff minus two to plus two. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving your valuable time for all the participants. I and, believe a lot of learning has happened. Thank you so much, sir. So and uh, I, 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 I simply stick to the basics. Or last me up quick shares on other things. Jate Jate Agarapi permission or so. Sure, sir. Most welcome. Okay. Up to Mulakat carries workshop with only hope I get Jate Jate Savi participants. Kill a share hair. Okay. Hamlak sub learner hair. Hamlok six there every time. So. कि सितारों को आंखों में महफूज रख लो महफूज उर्दू का वर्ड है जिसका मतलब है संभाल के रखो और सितारों का मतलब है रास्ता दिखना दिखना चाहिए कि सितारों को आंखों में महफूज रख लो बहुत दूर तक रात ही रात होगी मुसाफिर हो तुम भी मुसाफिर हैं हम भी कभी ना कभी किसी मोड़ पे फिर आपसे मुलाकात होगी थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच सर ओके सो वी विल मूव टू नेक्स्ट Plenary talk that is my doctor Alisha. So Monica, you can take over now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for today's talk, Dr. Alisha Berlin. Dr. Alisha completed her bachelor degree in biological and biomedical sciences from Delhi University. She completed her master degree in bioinformatics from Jamia Millia Islamia University. She was an intern at Technische University Dresden in 2015. She did her PhD from Heidelberg University 2020. She was a researcher at the University of Applied Science Kiel, Germany. She also joined the Institute of Bioinformatics, Bangalore as a genomic data scientist in 2020. Currently, she is working as a data scientist at Rostock University, Germany. She has developed a supervised machine learning algorithm for the detection of mouse behaviors in different conditions. Unsupervised machine learning algorithm in different distress-based animals. She was awarded foreign research grant from Rostock University. Without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Dr. Alisha Parveen to address the session on basics of deep learning. Thank you, ma'am, for being there. Over to you. Hello, guys. Uh, I think I should share my screen first. Lecture. Mm. Where's the presentation? Is, is it visible?
Hello, Dr. Anisha, you can start, but your slides are not visible. Hello, is it visible? Your slides are not visible, unfortunately. I mean, I'm just trying it and it's. Are you able to share and do you have share permissions? Yes, I think you have the rights. No, it, it need, uh, I need uh, uh, access. Okay, let me connect uh, the yeah, and show. Uh, Roshan, can you check? In, uh, Dr. Alisha has, uh, yeah, we can Is see it. Fine it. Now? Yes, we can see it. But the slides are not uh, here. We can see your screen. Now is it fine? Yeah, we can see your screen, but your slides are still not uh, displayed. Okay. Now is it visible? Because it's live one and it's sharing. Unfortunately, your slides are still not visible. We can see your uh, wallpaper, um, but not okay. the slides. Okay, I moment. Um, my screen. Okay. So now it's... Yes, we can see it, but uh, again, it disappeared. No? Again, it's... Yeah, yes, yes. Just try to go to the next slide, maybe. Slide with the, we see only the white uh, slide, blank one. Maybe try moving to the next slide. Uh, I'm moment. Is it? Is it? Is it visible now? Uh, no, unfortunately, there is only blank uh, screen, white screen. You can see the header says PowerPoint and the file and so on. Mm. Where is this? I'm using the share option and uh, just using my file, including all the videos. Uh, just try to reshare, maybe after you stop and then try to reshare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now we can see it. There you go. Mm. Good. Yeah, thanks. You can start now, ma'am. Okay, finally. So, uh, hello guys, my name is Alicia Parvin, Dr. Alicia Parvin. I'm currently working as a data scientist in Deutschland in Germany, and I will be presenting uh, an introduction to the deep learning in this video. And this video is for those who are new to the deep learning and machine learning and would like to get familiar with it. In this, uh, in this uh, video, you will get to know the overview of machine learning, deep learning technology, and uh, the uh, learn to speak deep learning language. Like there are different type of language we use mostly in different technologies. And also you will get to know the different workflow of deep learning and the machine learning. And also you can see some of the various application that I use that I use in my project also during my PhDs also. And where we can use these uh, techniques in future in other in in, in uh, other uh, fields. Uh, so uh, let's start with the slides. 
and yeah these are the projects that i'm going to cover in my future slides uh, the artificial intelligence what is machine learning how it is different from the traditional machine learning and the application different terminologies types all in all, I will give you some small and the basic overview so that you can easily understand what actually machine learning is. You don't need to dig up all the informations in this in this presentation and this lectures because it's not a small field; it's a quite vast field. So just try to get the overview, or just try to get uh, uh, like uh, uh, the um, the different words the, that we use in day to day life apart from the biologist, apart from the biomedical sciences students. So uh, let's come to the next slide. So as you can see, this is uh, actually a globe of the artificial intelligence and the subset of um, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, it's uh, a part of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, it leverages the computers and machine to maybe the uh, problem solving and decision making capabilities of human mind. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that use different statistical techniques or, or in order to improve uh, uh, the task or in order to improve the problem or an algorithm so with the experience that you have already the previous data set, which is called as the supervised learning. And uh, you need to make it more improve uh, machines or may, you need to make it uh, like prepare, improve algorithms. Uh, and this is called machine learning and we have the next is the deep learning it is actually the subset of the machine learning which is uh, com uh, actually again the subset of the machine learning well actually it's not actually the machine learning but it's uh, the machine learning consists of so many algorithms so we have like uh, svm random forest decision tree neural networks um, so it's actually the part of uh, actually the part of the neural network uh, it more condensed form like uh, if you have like big data set if you have like more data set like speech image uh, you need like more uh, con condensed uh, algorithm you need more robust algorithm more reliable algorithm so therefore in this part we need more deep neural network like deep learnings in this section okay Yeah. So as we, as I already uh, uh, explained you everything, uh, like what actually machine learning is, it's an uh, umbrella term of any computer program that does uh, the smart, uh, something very smart, like it's a very smart thing, artificial intelligence. And it's, as we already know, machine learning is a subset of AI and a deep learning is a subset of machine learning. While both machine learning and a deep learning, to learning, uh, uh, fall under the broad category of artificial intelligence and deep learning is what powers uh, the most human like artificial intelligence unlike machine learning models that need to be explicitly told how to make an accurate predictions or deep learning models capable of self learning through its own method of computing and it is inspired by the actual human brain and is particularly effective in classifying the object pattern recognition and the predictive analysis uh, and the, that I already explained in a very easy way. And this is uh, the type of machine learning. Let's uh, switch to the machine learning part because AI is quite vast and consists of so many, uh, so many other field or other algorithms. So let's come to the actually machine learning. What actually machine learning learning is was the basic things, was type of data we needed, and uh, what type of data which it should look, and what is the problem in the machine learning. Then we can move to the deep learning part, uh, but because it's a subset of machine learning. So uh, machine learning is uh, uh, consists of three types. It's unsupervised, it's a reinforcement, it's a supervised learning. So supervised learning algorithm further consists of classification and the regression. Where classification uh, uh, we can use in different uh, fields like image classification, identity detection, diagnosis, and also for the email spam predictions. And uh, for the regression, we can, ex we can predict uh, uh, the growth 
the weather forecasting, the popularity prediction, the market forecasting. Reinforcement is quite interesting learning in which we use the gaming for the gaming, for skill acquisition, for learning tasks, for robot navigation, and for a real time decision. So, and in the unsupervised learning, we have uh, two types of uh, clustering and the dimensionality reductions. So dimensionality reduction, what actually it's, it's you have like a high dimensional data, but actually you don't need all the features. And uh, I will explain you what actually features and the samples and all are. So, so therefore uh, we do some dimensionality reductions by by using some of the algorithms uh, which can easily detect, which can detect based on your problem. Uh, uh, the highly weighted features which reduces the dimensions uh, so that we can use this uh, the the generated output uh, for further analysis in order to train the machine learning in order to train the machine learning so last is the clustering method we have so clustering method is uh, actually the main part of unsupervised learning in unsupervised learning you don't have any class level you don't have any prior uh experience of the data you just uh, it automatically learned by its own knowledge uh, algorithms and give you a proper cluster form so i can explain you these exa example of all of them uh in further slides so that you can get the overview but i so that you can easily distinguish what actually you know, the supervised and the unsupervised uh, and the reinforcement uh, uh, learning in machine learning So let's come to the supervised learning. So uh, supervised learning, uh, let, let's take an example in a very easy way. Uh, we should not go into more, we don't need to dig up all the information of the supervised learning. So we have a proper data set. Uh, uh, we have like proper class, like uh, three category of the fruits, like apple, banana, and the pear. And we have the proper feature of each of the fruits, like proper annotations in in terms of color, shape, taste. So we have uh, this label data set. The label data, data set, we call it as a class plus features. So it's called a label data set. And then we give, uh, when then we give these features uh, and, uh, and the class label to the algorithms, like uh, as you can already, as you can already see it here, it's any algorithm, any supervised algorithm, you will get the list of uh, supervised algorithms on scikit-learn packages. And, after several uh, like hyperparameter tuning and uh, the parameter adjustments, uh, your program is trained. Your algorithm is totally trained now. And next, now you need to know that how your program is trained. You just need to see that if I give some uh, unknown data, some trusted data set, how it work. So therefore, we use uh, some unlabeled data. So unlabeled data is called only the feature, like the annotation, colors, uh, shape or taste and no class is available okay that's called uh, um, uh, it's called as uh, the unlabeled data set and uh, then again we give this unlabeled data set to again our trained programs and the, uh, based on the prior information based on the prior calculation it explain then it will predict uh, this program will predict whether uh, this uh, fruit belong to which of the class whether it belongs to the pear whether it belongs to the apple whether it belongs to the banana so that actually is called you should have uh, some prior information in supervised learning only then you can train your program it's like a mathematical equation make some mathematical equations and based on that mathematical equations you can easily get to know okay yeah it detect the apple okay it's correct it's an apples so then we go for further step like for evaluation for confusion matrix for different statistical score or for different graph prediction you can go with this all in all so you just you understand uh, my data my program is trained and it easily uh, it easily like classify based on classify the test data set so now we understand what actually the machine learning is sorry not machine learning only the part of the machine learning which is called as the supervised and here you can see 
it's a data set of the classification and uh, this is the uh, data set from my own experiments uh, it's a structured data set uh, structured data set is what uh, it's in the form of the x and y in the form of the matrix an unstructured data set is known as uh, um voice image and uh, so many others which you cannot find in the form of the matrices form so now these are the, some of the terminology that it's important for the one who want to understand the basis of the machine learning, what actually the class, what actually dependent is, because uh, uh, if you go to any of the machine learning expert, they first they ask what is the class, how many classes are there, and what's the label, how many labels are there, and uh, what is the independent variable, how many features are there. So I mean these are the almost same thing, but the terminology we are using the different way. It's like a figure of speech. So yeah, here first in first column, you can see it's a class or it's a dependent, like I need to predict the number of experiments. Here we have, we are, here, we here I had um, six, uh, six class labels, six experiments and their corresponding features like independent variables, like they're totally dependent on the, on the class. So, uh, so around 48 independent variable, 48 features we have in this, uh, in this and instances or input or samples, you can say it's a row or you, it's, it's a row. How many instances are present? If someone would ask how many instances, then you just need to explain what actually how many inputs, like how many samples are present, how many rows are present in your data set. If someone will ask you how many features or how many independent variables are present in your data set, then you need to explain excluding the class, excluding the class. And someone will ask you what is how many labels so then you can easily explain what actually label class or features are features or the independent data set are those we, we use for the further calculation or further machine learning analysis and class level is used to predict uh, based on uh, using those features uh, to predict the class so We have uh, again, it's again the supervised learning, but it's a regression problem. Again, it's again the supervised learning uh, because uh, in the uh, regression, uh, what's the difference between the regression and the classification? Classification give you discrete value in the form of the integer without any floating point. In a very easy language without any floating point in the form of zero, one, male, female, one, two, three, four, something like that. You will, uh, you can easily understand. Oh, this is the classification problem. If you have like proper uh, the output, output uh, like class label in the form of the uh, the uh, the real values, uh, sorry, continuous values in the form of the floating point, point, then it's a regression problem. Then you need to move to the regression problem. So from the output, oh, sorry, from the class label, you can easily understand whether your problem, whether your data set is a classification or it's a regression problem like here you can see you have like proper the labeled houses what's the features the amenities the area the size the number of rooms and you can give uh, your model to the uh, again you give your data set to the model and now your model is ready to predict the price of the house now you have again in the same area or uh, with the, the same feature but unknown uh, labeled like what's the price price is the class label here so again, with the features, we give it to the model, as you can see it here, and it will predict uh, uh, the price, the level of the model in the form of some floating point. As you can see here, it's quite expensive house, for sure. So, uh, so based on the number of room, the prior information, and uh, all the information gather, get uh, my model gather, and then predict to you the price of the price of the house. Uh, uh, so this is called the, this is the difference between actually this is the um, called a regression problem again it's, it is an, again the different example of uh, my project uh, it's a data set of the regression problem we have again the proper in input and you have like proper label or class label uh, or a class or dependent or output 
it's the epm velocity it is in the floating point therefore it is called as it it's called we called it as a, a regression problem so based on this mm -hmm. it's totally depend on your question it's not like that i cannot predict the genotype uh, genotype if if i will take a if I will take a genotype as a, um, um, as a class label and the rest of the feature, the rest of the column, I'll take it as an independent input, then I'll call, then I'll call this, um, this problem as a classification because it's in the form of uh, the zero and one proper integer form. But if I take label, it's totally depend on the which class label you want to predict, which one you want to know. So if you take it uh, class label uh, uh, in the form of the floating line, then it's a regression problem. So if you take it FG of 21, again, it's a, a regression problem. Body weight, again, it's a regression problem. So it's totally depend on what type of class label you want to predict, what type of output you want to know in future. Uh, then uh, then it, that, it, that it divides, that it um, defines whether it's the classification or, or it's a regression problem. So now it's uh, like I think it is easily under this is the basics of the data set. If you if you have like data set in future, so then you can easily understand what actually uh, what actually your problem is and how we can use this uh, problem, whether it's a data regression or it's a classification problem. Again, more uh, like in more detail about the classification and the regression. As you can see, you have a proper student profile. Uh, the report card of uh, two students, uh, and the scores in English, biology, EVS, in the physics, maths, German, chemistry, and ecology. And if your problem is the classification, then okay, you will get to know the, the whether your student, whether your kid is fail or pass in the form of zero and one. And if you want to get the percentage of the student, then that percentage is, uh, then uh, this problem automatically moves to the regression problem. So this is the main, this is the actual difference between uh, uh, the classification and uh, the regression problem. And yeah, so again, it's the small and the very cute figure, as you can see it here. It's uh, it is uh, something different from the supervised algorithm. It, we call it as uh, unsupervised. We have a proper input again, unlabeled data set. Again, in unsupervised learning, you just you will get only unlabeled with no classes. Let us take an example. You have a bunch of fruits. Uh, again, same fruits. You put so many fruits. I put at least so many fruits here. And uh, yeah. And I give it to my algorithm, my machine learning algorithm, and do some calculations. They're like I am reviewing since I'm the reviewer, so I'm reviewing after each and every iteration, after each and every uh, epoch level, and I'm checking uh, how machine learning is working, and I'm checking at each and every steps, so, and give a proper parameter, proper information, and proper mathematical equations. I need this, 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 and based on the based on the mathematical equation based on the in, in information it automatically make a cluster uh okay this is apple it looks same uh color are same shapes are same so maybe i can put it in one basket so again the uh the peach as you can see it's a peach of fish here okay uh, looks same it's red in color it shape are same so as you can see it's uh, it based on your based on the visibility based on the colors it divide uh, it to make a color share in the three bas in the three basket and uh, and again uh, in the end it found uh, machine learning found uh, one of the one of the fruit which cannot which cannot put it in the annual three basket so therefore we can take it as an outlier we can put it in another basket also but yes i told my algorithm that no i don't want four cluster i just want only three cluster so then what my algorithm will do ah confusion 
so that part is algorithm will make a three cluster but the fourth one will automatically goes to go at as a, to the outlier basket so it's not a actually a clustered part so i will remove that fruit uh, that which is not clustered properly so it means it's not it doesn't belongs to the apple pear or the banana so this is the actual difference like in unsupervised you don't need a class you just need a feature and uh, the, the in, based on some of uh, the black box or the whatever it is going behind the algorithm it automatically make a cluster so So now you understand what actually the classification, the regression, what is actually the supervised and what is actually the um, unsupervised learning. So let's come to some of the good applications of some of the good application. I Okay, as you can see it here. Uh, as you already know, it's a pandemic disease. And uh, uh, obesity, it's an ab abnormal and excessive accumulation of the fat tissue associated with severe overweight and the obesity is one of the challenging diseases of the 21st century. So according to the Eurostat publications in 2019, around 53% of the adult in Europe are overweighted. So this is actually a problem these days uh, during the COVID situation. So you can predict even, uh, uh, so therefore I just came, I, I did some of the experiments that uh, how it work with the, the prediction, how the obese, uh, how the obese animal or maybe the obese, obese patient behave, why there is a change in their mood because it's uh, directly correlated with each other. So that, that's the actual problem uh, that obesity, it is in the pandemic and how we can use this problem, this problem in the machine learning. So how many factors? There are several studies uh, have also indicated infrequency or lack of exercise at individual education level as determining factors of obesity. Besides this, both gender and age also seem to have influence on a predisposition. The body fat distribution differ between the genders with women are being more likely to carry fat on the body and men being more prone to the central obesity that is carrying weight in the body. So change in the body distribution of fat with the reproductive cycle in women and age in both genders. So this is the, the difference between that, how uh, uh, obesity affect uh, in different genders or in the age also. So there is another causes, uh, uh, obviously that I already explained the in behavior, the proper social education, uh, like uh, how they are uh, interacting with others because nowadays uh, we are more, toward the online digitalizations, watching movies, that's it. We don't have any outside gatherings or maybe no, no exercise or environmental factors. There are so many, some of the biological factors also because sometimes the, bio, the obesity, um, they are correlated with your, uh, the genetic and with genetics also. So it's a totally, it's totally depend on uh, the cause of the obesity. So it's a quite serious problem these days. No. Again, this is the one of the difficult problems in animals also. Obese animal, uh, how it reacts uh, because uh, you don't know, you can easily explain, okay, uh, explain with the humans, you can easily speak uh, properly. But in animal, it's quite difficult, uh, uh, especially the obese animal. It, it is very really difficult uh, uh, that uh, uh, to know the behavior of the of the animals. Uh, so there is therefore, uh, therefore I try to therefore we predict. Uh, therefore I predict uh, the behavior of the mouse and how mouse is uh, behavior changing. Uh, based uh, using the machine learning from non-behavior parameter. If I take only the non-behavior parameters 
and uh, uh, switch uh, and predict behavior then i can easily understand uh, how, how much uh, mouse is in stress uh, what's the locomotion of the mouse uh, and the, the anxiety behavior because mouse uh, mouse or animals cannot uh, speak to you so i mean people are just making the judgment of how it interacting with human and with other animal and with other plants and how it interacting with the sun and the dark and because sometimes uh, Sometimes the obese mouse or obese animals they uh, they love to uh, they like to stay in a dark uh, not in the area or not in the sun part. So we don't know what actually they want, what is going on in their mind. Uh, so therefore we try to predict the behavior of the mouse based on the anxiety and uh, the locomotion behavior uh, using the non behavior. So that in the end we don't need to kill because in in the for the experiments uh, we killed so many mouses for uh, so therefore we are trying to mimic uh, some uh, uh, machine learning uh, we are trying to construct a machine learning which mimics uh, the, like a humans so then we don't need to kill the mouse for future not even we don't need to give any stress to the mouse also and uh, we can easily get the feature from the mouse and we can use uh, for uh, the black box for the machine learning purpose so that's the point that let's see how i can predict the behavior of the mouse from non-behavior data these are the steps involved uh, in my work uh, in in this project uh, that i have proper uh, uh, non behavior features again the supervised learning body weight liver weight visceral weight subcutaneous weight blood glucose bodily length leukocyte erythrocyte hemoglobin hematocrit uh, thrombocyte fg21 and the genotypes again as you can see uh, these are the non behavior parameters and in the in the right hand side of your figure you can see the behavior the proper epm total distance epm velocity or open field total distance open field velocity it means that with the epm you will you will get to know how much ancient uh, anxiety uh, behavior what is the anxiety behavior of the mouse and from the open field you can easily understand what the locomotion the velocity how much speed it's totally depend if the mouse is really active and very fast there is no effect of the obesity of the mouse then for sure it will move fast this mouse will move fast without any problem so you can easily and predict it but again in the left hand side as you can see it's a non-behavior parameter so you uh, i mean uh, with the liver fat, with the subcutaneous fat and the visceral fat, the, uh, even the erythrocyte, hemo, hemoglobin, hematocrit and thrombocyte, these are the features which anyhow if you are, are trying to get this information, in any case you have to kill the mouse because it's the weight you need to take out the liver from the mouse and get the weight and then in the end you have to kill the mouse. Again then was the point. So therefore we did some of the phases. So after the exploration phase, I just came to know we don't need to use all of these uh, all of these features. We can use only the body weight, the blood uh, the, uh, the body weight, the blood glucose, the body length, FGF twenty one only, and four to five features. As I already explained you in the dimensionality reduction, I use some of the algorithm for reduces the dimensions. So luckily, I I just got maybe not luckily okay with the proper parameters. Uh, I got in the after exploration phase, uh, I, came, I got uh, body weight, uh, blood, uh, body length, FGF21, and uh, the blood glucose and the genotype as a uh, very important, the uh, highly weighted parameters. And after these parameters, uh, you don't need to kill the mouse. And then these parameters, uh, like these features, are ready to go for the training phase and the evaluation phase and the, for the prediction phase. So in the training phase, you can use as much as you can the models depending on your computation system. You can, if you know, if you if you know with these algorithms are very much important, then you can use only one algorithm. You, if you want to see how your model, how your data work with other models also, so you can use another models also. And next step is the evaluation phase. In the evaluation, you just need to know since it's a regression problem regression problems so, so it's important that it, you need to know uh, uh, that uh, how much loss we are getting during the training how much loss we are getting during the validation part 
it should not be uh, too much loss or it should not be overfitting so that's evaluation part you can easily understand uh, you can easily understand uh, the, um, the underfitting and the overfitting problem so in the end you can easily predict uh, uh, epm total distance epm velocity total uh, yeah, how much how much uh, total distance moved by the animals and uh, with with which with how much velocity so these are the uh, the prediction that i that i that i use for the machine learning so in the end you don't need to kill the mouse but what is the conclusion so you don't need to kill the mouse your mouse will be safe you don't need to give a lot of stress to the mouse for sure when you touch the mouse when you when you hold the mouse for sure mouse for sure will be in the stress because obviously no one wants this so but not much stress and you don't need to go this is also good for the animal welfare uh, field that uh, we can mimic a machine learn we can use the machine learning that mimics a mouse model as for the prediction of the behavior in any of the condition not only the obese condition you can use it in all of the con in any of the conditions so this is the pipeline that i generated and is it and it's also the basic pipeline for machine learning for machine learning steps also So this is the conclusion. Hmm. So in the uh, so as uh, as you can see uh, in the line with the three R principle, the result of the present study could lead to the reduction in the breeding of the mouse strains, as both sexes can be used equivalently, uh, uh, equivalently for the behavior analysis. In addition to the in addition, the duration of the experiment uh, can be shorter since. Uh, since the mouse already shows significant behavior alteration at the age of eight weeks, this may lead, this may also lead to the reduction of the stress to the animal. So this is called as the refinement. So for sure, it's, uh, I have generated the machine learning for sure, but maybe we will get some more di different machine learning algorithms for future also. So statistically, I understand. Statistically, we understand that there is no significant difference between the gender, and there is no significant difference between the ages in terms of the obesity. So therefore, we don't need to use gender and the age for further analysis. So it means that we can use any of the gender, either male or either female. So uh, and also we can preserve female for for further uh, for further production. And uh, and age is we can use any of the age. We don't need to like wait for forty weeks of the mouse. Like uh, experiment, it goes to like forty weeks, fifty weeks, like six months. So therefore, we don't need to uh, stay. We don't need to stay for a uh, six month. Uh, uh, we can use any of the age group of the mouse and start prepare and start generate your data set. Other non behavior parameters. And then you don't need to kill the mouse with that parameters. You can use your machine learning, like my machine learning algorithms, and you can predict the behavior of the mouse. All in all, you don't need the other one. It's a very good example that uh, how we can reduce the time, how we can reduce the bias problem by the humans, how we can reduce the animals by euthani by by the euthanasia on and uh, how we can reduce uh, how we can like uh, make it more uh, more robust uh, part so you don't need to like spend like 6 a.m 5 a.m like students are coming to the lab it's checking the food of uh, the mouse uh, how much food and uh, proper these are these things uh, like it's a totally time saving part so as you can see uh, uh, machine learning is it's it's uh, like it's it is like a gem for uh, or it's a very promising field and at least in my field it's very promising field but actually you can use machine learning uh, in each of and every field it's totally depend on uh, it's totally totally depend on uh, how you handle the data and uh, what type of question you have but this is the problem if you understand your data set if, and if you understand what type of question i have then the rest of the thing is very easy it's it's not a, 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 a big list of code you can find everything in the packages this is one of the best example for again one of the best uh, uh, example or uh, the application it's a human word robot it's a sophia it's a sophia it's um, 
um it's a face tracking it's totally ai method uh, robot and also this robot has some of the citizenship from different countries i have no idea which countries but yes it's from different uh, she, uh, he, it had has uh, some <laughs> Mm, uh, citizenship also and um, yeah, you can see it uh, anywhere on the youtube on the on the pay on any of the blogs uh, it's quite popular uh humanoid robot uh, it uh, uses the ai method like face tracking like emotion recognition like movement using deep neural network and also the dialogue is generated by the decision tree which is again one of uh, the machine learning part and and it's integrated and with this out and it's integrated with these output uniquely so it's one of the excellent example of artificial intelligence use uh, artificial intelligence for the for the production of a humanoid robot so it's called Zofia. so Again, this is one of the good motivations if someone wants to enter into some AI and something like that. This is so many interesting movies you can find easily on Netflix or the Disney or something. It's uh, the Ultron Avengers. Uh, you can see the Jarvis. Uh, some I think in yellow color. And you have like Star Trek. It's also based on the Discovery series. Discovery series. It's also based on the artificial intelligence it's a war you can see between the two uh between the two i think a spaceship i guess and it's totally based on the ai it's the maybe it's a future <laughs> i guess so but it's very interesting and uh very like um a really good movies uh, like uh, to see that um, how ai work maybe there is a possibility but obviously this is these movies uh, they are uh, not true these are not true but yes you will get to know okay is it possible can we do this can we make job style something like that so there is you know you just need to have caution you just need to trust that how we can use this uh, this technique uh, in different field so now you understand with the this um, uh, this uh, artificial and the machine learning and some of this beautiful example of machine learning artificial and the deep learning and yes as you can see the data is increasing day by day we have a lot of genomics data we are having a lot of uh, the machine uh, voice data it's more uh, image data it's increasing day by day it's a lot of data so still again there's a problem there is there is a uh, drawbacks of some of the old learning algorithms like machine learning again if you increase the data a lot, then there may be uh, a less performance you can find it. So therefore, if you have, as I already explained in the slide one, it's if you need uh, some of the big data set, uh, some of uh, the data set which uh, is increasing day by day, or maybe some of the voice like genomics data set you need, some proteomic data set and you have like in beta or in you know, gigabyte you have like data sets and uh, then you cannot use uh, uh, the traditional machine learning algorithms then uh, i would prefer you to switch to the deep learning so, so deep learning can handle it in more because it's more condensed and it's a more uh, robust so but still for the small data set if you have like small uh, data sets then again deep learning is is it's not that good to, to use uh, because the deep learning you need as much as you can can give the data set uh, as much as as much as you can give the data set to them uh, to the deep learning you will get the good performance uh, so it's uh, it's just depend on the data set yeah and you we need to we need to update ourselves we need to this is the old crow and the modern crow. So you don't need to do some extra effort. Just need to use your mind and how you can get the water in a very less time and continuously. So I mean, uh, therefore, it's important that in uh, instead of using some traditional way, 
it's not i'm not saying that it's a wrong but yes it try to get uh, uh, the overview of this new techniques also and uh, maybe this new techniques will help a lot in your field in your problem so it's totally depend on how you use because sometimes the traditional works better if you have like small you don't need to give so much effort because you're used to it with that then it's fine but yes if you have like first to learn something new and uh, in the form of the mind by informatics in form then it, it is good uh, like uh, uh, to use this technique also at least the basic machine learning and the basis of the deep learning because because actual machine learning and deep learning it's quite difficult or it's quite a big field so mostly computer scientists uh, people use it so we just we have like a proper uh, packages in python and in r and you can directly use it and easily you can protect you can use these packages in your problem, adjust your data according to the package and just you're ready to go. It's not that difficult also, but yes, it's important that we should try to update ourselves so that we can save our effort, we can save our time, we can save the, we can increase the accuracy, we can make some robust things if you don't need to like sit in front of the system for a long time. So therefore it's important that we should update ourselves by deep learning yes i already explained how is it useful and why we need it so consider this example from an automotive use case you may be familiar with this or you have seen something similar this screen this is a screen capture from a demo put together it by the it's automotive driver assistance system team showing using of deep learning so to classify objects seen from an automobile's front facing cameras in this demo deep learning is used to classify each pixel in the image as belongs to one of the five categories vehicle road sign person background and then the demo colors in the, uh, the image appropriately for the visualization so deep learning is one of the key technology technologies enabling auto autonomous vehicles so, mm. and this uh, deep learning is a way of classifying what kind what uh, is a classifying clustering and predicting the thing okay so what kind of other things it can be classified with deep learning picture or videos as in the automotive example but it can be any type of data music speech radar time of flight and or some other machines data set like maybe some factories are going out there or something like that anything you can find so really any type of data if you want to classify you can use deep learning in in this part so so Deep learning is actually same like the artificial, same like the human uh, brain. So it's, it's like artificial neurons, we have a proper hidden layers. We have a in red color in the right hand side of the figure. You can see it's, um, you can see the red balls, like the red colors, circular thing as it's an in input. And we have a proper hidden layers. And in the end, you will you can easily see the output. What type of output? Everything in the hidden layer is the black box. It's a proper calculation. Each of the balls they have their like own calculation. So it mimics the human brain. Like human brain, we have a proper input from eyes, from taste, from ear, from nose, from hand. You'll get to you will get easily the data from these organs and it processes in the brain and it will give you the output like whether okay this voice is not good this voice is not clear so from ear you get the input and your brain process and give you the okay this is not so we are responding according to our uh, according to our input data set like with the nose you can smell and with the eyes you can see like uh, this color looks better this color doesn't look better and with the taste you can easily oh this is sour and this is sweet and this is, and with the hand you can easily classify easily oh this is hot this is warm 
so because of this because of because of these input you can easily understand you can easily uh, get the input and process your uh, your input data set uh, the brain process input and it can easily predict oh what i and you can easily classify your data set so this is the actual uh, the beauty of the nature that how brain work uh, so therefore uh, we got the deep learning again it uh, it's an artificial neurons uh, and uh, hidden layers it look like a totally the brain and you will get the output so as mentioned and earlier deep learning is inspired by the structure of human brain it its ability to think like human is achieved partly through the use of a neural network neural network are series of algorithms modeled after the human brain or human brain just as the brain can recognize pattern and help us to categorize and classify information neural networks do the same for the computer computers so neural networks are essentially mathematical model to solve an optimization problem they are made of neurons the basic computation unit of neuro, neural networks a neuron can take uh, an input say x let's say, say x it's an input and to do some computations let's say multiplication and some addition something like that this is called uh, weight with the with the proper weight to produce the value some to produce the output value let's say z is equals to wx plus b b is the bias w is the weights this value is passed to the non-linear functions called activation functions to produce the final output called active activation of the neuron and then there are many kind of activation functions some of the popular activation functions are sigmoid relu tanha uh, and one neuron can be connected to the multiple neuron. If you stack neural neurons in a single line, it's called layer, and which is the next building block of neural network. As you can see, the neurons in green make one layer, which is the first layer of the network through which input data input data set is passed to the network. Similarly, the last layer is called output layer, as shown in red. The layer in between the input and output are called hidden layers. In this example, we have only one hidden layer show in blue. The network which have many hidden layers tend to be more accurate and are called deep network. And hence machine learning algorithms which uses the which uses these um, deep networks are called as the deep neuro, uh, deep learning. So again, again, it's same. We are using the image. We are using image in this part. Again, more deep learning, like uh, uh, more information about the deep learning. So it reports the output in terms of likelihood. The network tries to learn by computing this generated likely report with that of the expected output. If the output reported doesn't match, with the expected hour, it adjusts its network parameters and repeats the process till the time it has learned to report the likelihood of an uh, image being a dog higher than the likelihood of the other class, um, classes of the image it receives as input. So as shown in this example, so once the network has learned when fit with an input, uh, in input image of a dog, it reports that there is a 90% likelihood that the image it was fed is a dog and 10% likelihood the image is uh, image is of a wolf. So based on this, uh, this network will conclude the image is uh, of a dog. So we have a different type of um, deep learning neural network. Uh, like uh, this is just uh, some of the basics, uh, some of the small part, um, multi-layer perceptron, convolution uh, neural network, recurrent neural network. So we have uh, some of the thing. Otherwise, we have so many layers. Uh, you can even adjust your layers also. You don't need to use only this structured uh, layer, uh, network. So within uh, the deep learning, there are obviously there are different uh, neural network. These are the architecture uh, led it themselves. Uh, to solve 
different problems. In this video, we will cover three different neural network for sure MLP, like multilayer perceptron, CNN, convolution neural network, and the RNN. And, uh, and uh, multilayer perceptron is probably one of the most traditional type of deep learning architectures uh, one may find. Uh, and even you can use it, and that's why every elements of the previous layer is connected to every element of the next layer. MLP MLP fell out of favor in part because they are hard to train. Fact. While there are many reasons for that hardship, one of them is because their dense connections does not allow them to scale easily for various computer vision problems. This is where the convolution neural network or CNN came in. So it consists of a multi-layer perceptrons, which are designed to use a minimal amount of pre-processing. So CNN is a fat feed forward deep neural network. In feed forward network, the information move only in one direction from the input nodes and through the hidden node, the hidden nodes to the output nodes. There are no cycle or the loop in the network. CNN takes a fixed size input and generate fixed size output. They are mostly used in the computer vision application and they are deal for images and video processing for object detection, classification, and the semantic segmentations. So the examples discussed earlier of the deep learning network used in the automotive front-facing camera or the network recognition, the image of the dog of the dog are both CNN. Another type of network is the recurrent neural network called RNN. So RNN are called recurrent since they receive input update the hidden states depend on the previous computation and they make predictions for every element of the sequence. So RNN utilizes utilizes the feed forward uh, feed forward connections extended to the include uh, extended to include the feedback connections uh, to form a cycle. So as you can see it's a proper cycle. So it's a network the network with the, uh, the memory and keep the information what has been processed so far. So RNN are useful for the time series data set where the feature representing the past, uh, where the feature representing the past are assumed to have the bear in the future. So RNN are ideally for the speech and for the text translations and from speech to the text and from one another, especially from the NLP. So as, uh, and it's uh, well being used for the predictive maintenance. So this is the three type of uh, again you have a proper yeah, you have a proper it's, it's a typical layer of the uh, mlp you have proper input data set and the proper as i already explained what actually in the previous slide was actually the mlp you have proper input and you are calculating the loss after each and every uh, epoch or after each and every uh, iterations between the validation and the trainings and you will get uh, the score or you will get the prediction problems in the form of the distance and the open field and the here you can see the hidden layer consists of so many layers so, so many layer, like three to four it's totally depend on you and uh, which activation function we use it like uh, there are so many activation functions like sigmoid for relu and uh, the linear 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 if you are using some classification then you can use the sigmoid Otherwise, the linear linear relu is uh, linear and relu we use it mostly for the regression. But yes, relu we mostly use in the hidden layers also. But extraordinary depend on then the output layer which activation function you are using. So here I use the linear one, the most easy one. And if you have like some classification, then you can use the sigmoid function also. You have like proper parameters and model structure, and you can tell okay this is the model, and we have this input, and we can predict this output. So all in all, nothing. Here, as here you can see, it's a, again as I already explained you, different so many so many so many balls and what how it works. So the basic unit of the computation, the neural network is called uh, the neurons, and of often known as the node uh, or the units. It is with input from some of the other nodes uh, or from an external source and computates computes the each input associated with proper weights. We have W1, W2, W3, and until Wn, which is designed on the basis of its relative importance to the other input. The node applies to the proper function 
we have like proper after submission with the proper sum uh, with the proper activation function to the weight uh, to the weighted sum of the input the uh, as you can see this uh, network takes a numerical input x1 x2 and has associated with it w1 w2 with those of the input and additionally there is a one input we call it as a bias as you can see it b associated with the we associated with it because otherwise you will get the overfitting problem the output y from the neuron is computed as shown in the figure the f is the one as i already explained with the activation point. the purpose of exactly the most important point is the purpose of this uh, activation function why we use activation function the activation function actually uh, it's uh, used to introduce the non-linearity into the output of the neuron and this is important because the most real world data is in is the non-real, non-linear, and we want uh, a neuron to learn from those non-linear representation. Therefore, we use uh, uh, activation functions. So, and this is just a small equation that we already studied uh, during the ninth or the tenth class with the proper summation and the activation phase. And uh, you are ready to go. It's nothing. But since we had, we have so many nodes, we have so many neurons. So therefore, we need. We need uh, uh, so many calculation, therefore we need a uh, deep learning part in this. Otherwise, when you open only single neuron, single node, then you can see it's just a summation. It's just a activation function and you get the output. That's it. Just the mathematics inside it. Rest is, it's not a big thing, but yes, since we use um, hundred and a thousand of the nodes also, therefore we need some high end uh, uh, computation system. And we have the, as mentioned in the previous slide, each of these DNNs are made of several, for example, CNN are the, uh, some of the key layers are convolution, ReLU, max pool, and fully connected, fully connected. The convolution layer is a key layer in CNNs and it's filtering layer and is a filtering layer and is the most computationally intense layer and dominates the performance of a given CNN architecture. The ReLU, the ReLU layer, also known as the Reactivation Linear uh, Unit, is a commonly used activation function as an activation function layer. So the pooling layer is uh, a downsampling layer used to reduce the computational cost, how much you are getting the cost, like the loss. And the fully connected layer is one of the last layer in CNN and helps to classify the data, data, data set. There are many more layers that are used in CNNs, but these are some of the common layers. These are some, this is one of the basic layers. Otherwise, you can increase the layer as much as you can. It's totally depend on your data and your problem. Again, so uh, as you can see, it's, it is not that difficult, but rest, uh, convolution, pooling, again, fully connected. These all are the black box. You just need input, you will get the output. But again, it's important that if I open some little bit black box, it's nothing. It is nothing. It's uh, it's a quite um, it's nothing as I already explained you with the, the single node. But yes, uh, we have uh, so many layer. We have so many more uh, node. So it makes everything very difficult. So therefore, uh, we need a high computation and this part. Again, this is RNN. This is RNN, same, same like uh, that I already explained in the previous one. Nothing is, uh, you have like a proper loop and uh, uh, in, in the recurrent neural network. So I don't think so. It's, I should explain more in this part. Yeah. You have a, a proper. Uh, you have, uh, as you can see, there is a difference between the, the convolution network and the recurrent neural network so uh, use the filter and the pool uh, uh, convolution network but it you it results uh, it feed the result back into the network and uh, input it's uh, receive especially the fixed image and you will get the output in the form of the proper category with the, the confidence level of the predictions and here you can use any in the recurrent you can use any of the different text any of the different image uh, any of the different voices and you will get the result in the form of uh, the sentences of oh, that that's really good you can use it for our recurrent neural network for uh, the micro arrays 
or i think uh, you can use it in uh, for uh, you have like so many images uh, or um, or not images images is good for composition so i mean if you have like a transcriptomics data set uh, and uh, you just need to preprocess you just need to process your data so i think uh, the recurrent university is very good for you to use it so especially it, it is especially for the text and the videos and conversion especially for the images so and this is the actual difference between the recurrent neural network and the cnn these are the type of other machine uh, other uh, other deep neural network feed forward radial deep feed forward that i already explained recurrent you have uh, lstm long and short memory so all of them they work differently uh, different differently like a proper deep learning you have like a yellow color in the form of uh, the output in input data set and orange is in the form of the output data set and rest is going on inside the black box so that you just need to care, don't care you just need to check uh, the parameters so since i haven't used all of them but yes i have used a few of them uh, in my project so it is good if you can use it with uh, with the data set just play with this just need to play you don't need to like focus only on it just think okay it's just a game that we are doing so i always take it as a game so and it's important to understand the usage of uh, the network model in deep learning so when designing a neural network model one has to decide which layer to use how many neurons to use in each layer how to arrange the layer designing the architecture is slightly complicated so there are many standard cnn model and rn model which work great for many standard problems some of the well known of these are alexnet google net and inception ResNet. these models are previously winners of uh, of some of the contest so uh, some of the contests like uh, ILSBRC, it stands for ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. It's an annual software contest run by the ImageNet that challenges the research teams to evaluate their algorithms on the given data set and compare to achieve the higher accuracy on several visual recognition tasks. And the LXNet is one of the first deep networks to put ImageNet classification accuracy and was winning model in 2012. Since then, uh, network have been more uh, have become more complex with better accuracy, but have also found a way to achieve more efficient performance. These models are often used uh, as the starting points and the benchmark for development. But it's important to note that these are not embedding friendly networks. When considering a network model so for an embedded system, where power, size, and cost are often limiting factors in designing and it is important to design networks that are efficient for the computation and employ the uh, some of the techniques and uh, to improve the computation computational efficiency of the trade-off for the small reduction in the accuracy so there you can find all of them the platforms if there is no problem and uh, but for initial task for the basic part i can ex i can i can uh, use uh, i mostly use the google net and alexnet you just you just have some uh, you can just use some of the some of the image any image you can take just use it as an input and call the cnn and then just check and play with it what output you will get it's nothing inside it again we have constructed the data set we know data set featured everything so we train the data set everything but again we need to know what type of score we use it to, to check the uh to evaluate the model okay so for regression we use r squared adjusted r squared absolute error mean absolute error if you have a regression you can based on these scores there are so many other scores also but here yes, some of the scores uh people use it and uh, for the classification you can use how much log loss you are getting what the accuracy of the model how many uh, what uh, was the precession and recall roc and auc curve and for the unsupervised model, you have uh, uh, RN index, mutual information, and other so on. So it's uh, it's totally depend on um, uh, like what type of problem you have, and you need uh, these scores uh, for further uh, for further evaluation of your model. Hmm. 
so building a uh, building a solution uh, using the deep learning is a big challenge for data scientists and engineers frameworks are tool to is building deep learning uh, solutions frameworks uh, offer a level of abstraction and simplify potentially difficult programming tasks there there uh, there's a growing range of uh, open source framework available and often are built for specific purpose and offering unique range of features the most popular frameworks are tensorflow cafe keras scikit-learn pytorch theano lntk I'm sorry nltk so these are the packages so tensorflow was developed tensorflow was developed by the google and is uh, is the most used deep learning framework today based on the github stars and fox and the stack over overflow activity Cafe was developed by the Berkeley Vision and, uh, and Learning Center. It is popular for the community support and for its primary ap application in modeling convolution neural network and for its selections of pre-trained models known as the model zoo. So there are other, um, one of the best and the popular uh, languages or the platform for these frameworks are the C++ and the Python. So. I mostly prefer go for the I mostly go for the Python and for the visualization I go for the R. So where we can use it? Here are the few examples. Here are the few things the area of the factory automations and control are made. Uh, like you can use it in for the deep learning solution opportunity for the deep learning uh, deep learning solutions. You can use it for the prediction, for the traffic prediction that I already explained you with the figures for search in general, for medical diagnosis that people are using these days, even in the operations or team. We use uh, machine uh, AI based uh, equipment and the tools for email spam filtering, for image recognition, we use RN, uh, sorry, we use the CNN for visual pers personal uh, assistant. We use RNN and for automated translation, we have uh, again, we can use it. So we have so many real world problems uh, and we can use machine learning and the, the deep learning depending on your data. If you have like less data, a lot more data and you can use machine learning ready to go. But if you have like more data, you cannot handle it. And you need a very good computation system, then I would I would rather prefer you, you to suggest that the go for the uh, deep learning. So you can use it. Again, it's another another form of uh, the application of deep learning in another they are in the area of the factory automation and control has many opportunities for deep learning solution and for improve from improving the accuracy of industrial robotics exactly from the industrial robotics used on a pick and play system so to improve the inspection systems on assembly line and to analyze the data from the industry machine to aid in part predictive maintenance of those machines. Deep learning will be used for numerous places in factory automation and controls. So, so for a very good, very, very good and the different examples, you can look at the area of the agriculture where deep learning can help to determine the health of, health of the crop, crops and the develop optimized irrigations and harvestings. Yeah, it's, it's really good in agriculture. And the world of uh, the retail is also looking into the deep learning to improve the speed and accuracy of automated checkout, as well as understanding the shoppers need and the preference and providing the incentives that would appeal uh, to a particular shoppers. So, so there are so many examples that as much as you can, like it's totally depend on how much you can use, how much you can use the data, how much you can play with the data using this technique. So I play most of the time with this data. And try to and try to incorporate uh, these problem these data into the machine learning. Like uh, I always like think, okay, if I have this data, how can I use the machine learning? Is there any possibility? If not, then okay, fine, it's no no issues. But if there is a possibility, can we use it? Or if yes, then how we can use it? And what algorithms? So I just just for me to play, I mostly use all of all of the algorithm just to get uh, the overview just to get a different problem if you don't fail then you will not learn in future so therefore after, after each and every algorithm i got so many failure but uh, yes after each failure i 
I always learn, learn something new. And this is the summary. What actually deep learning is? Artificial intelligence is an umbrella term for any computer program that does something smart. A machine learning is a subset of AI and the deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So deep learning has a root, has its roots in the neural network. It's a more condensed form of the neural network deep learning. So deep and neural network are set of algorithms modeled loosely after the human brain that are designed to recognize pattern. Speaking of deep learning, neural network types, nodes, layers, development frameworks, and the network network models. So the deep learning solutions develop. Uh, there is a uh, so many uh, development flow. You can find it and you can use it. Fair, you can use the application of the deep learning. So and. Yes, it's completed because it was a little bit boring, but it's no problem. It's just a basics. You just need to know what actually deep learning, where we can use it, how we can use the data, how we can play the data. Is there any framework, any algorithms, or maybe any platform which is already present? So there are so many you can use it. Uh, just need to use some small data set and just play initially and then slow slowly because uh, in a single day, it's very difficult to understand. But yes, if you give some time to it, to this technology, then you can easily understand it. It's not, it's not a big problem. So that's all for today. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Alisha. Wonderful talk. Uh, now I would request uh, if there are any questions for Dr. Alisha from panelists first, maybe. Okay, so um, let's see if there are any questions in the chat box. Please feel free to write your questions. Okay, so there there is first question for you. Do, do you think the name is? good for uh, deep learning techniques dr naresh is asking this question yes uh, uh, you can use the uh, nime it's a good flat platform uh, you, initially if you want to use the deep learning so then it is very very good to, uh, to use uh, the uh, this um, this software we can we can say it but again it is it totally depend on uh, your data set how much big if you have like not too big data well set, then you can use it easily with the NIMA. But yet, if you have like quite big data set, then uh, you cannot use the local systems. Then you need a server. So for on servers, then you need to call your own code and uh, then you can play with it. So for initial, it's a very good uh, platform and very uh, promising platform. Okay, there is a follow-up question which notes to think are reliable from NIMA. What type of nodes? Source for the nodes. Need to be more clear, Dr. Nish. Can you write a bit more? In detail? Yeah, a little bit more. Like what type of nodes? Source from nodes. Um, for source for nodes uh, means uh, means can we use the name as a code uh, and use it on the server? Yes. Sir. Uh, yeah, I mean, exactly. It's uh, uh, There are so many factors. Uh, you can uh, choose the models. Uh, at uh, first, uh, you need to explore your data set. First of all, the, the, the one that I did it for the exploration phase, you need to explore, is there any multicollinearity, feature selections, your scaling, uh, everything. These are the pre-processing step, which is also known as the exploration phase. You just need to first think what type of data you have, then you need to check the class label, what type of class label you have, if it is supervised or if it is unsupervised. Once you get to know these things, then you can just see, uh, uh, like uh, for the small data set, you can use the SVMs. But if it is more data set, then uh, SVM mostly don't work very good. It doesn't work very good. So I'm so it's totally depend on your size of the size of the data set, that what type of data set you have. What is uh, where we use profit model in uh, deep learning? 
my data is uh, uh, the organic chemical compound with molecular descriptors yes you can use it if you can uh, like uh, make your if you can uh, like uh, arrange your data according to your algorithm so according to the algorithm then you can use the algorithm yes you can predict if you want to predict the activity that the one that i already predict the activity of the mouse behavior so you can do it the same thing with the model with the organic compounds uh, yeah exactly organic chemical compound i have used the uh, i have used the mouse model for their activity like locomotion and the anxiety behavior that's the activity of the mouse in the wild type and in the obese mouse so you can use it in your uh, organic chemical compounds with different if you have different descriptors with a proper chemical compound with a, with a proper sample so then you can use it it's not a problem okay thank you dr um, alisha so um, there is maybe maybe pnb uh, one Ilana, can you please put your question in the chat box that will be better for us yeah now you're in you now you can ask i think you're in the panelist so please ask unmute yourself and ask PNV1 Silala, please unmute yourself and ask. You have to unmute yourself. Please be, be louder. Can you, can you be a little, little bit louder? You are not audible. So your voice is very feeble. Please try to be light, louder. We cannot hear you. Okay, I think then uh, there are no further questions. Thanks to Dr. Alisha for a wonderful session. And we will meet again uh, today at 8 p.m. where Dr. Avina Sharma from NCC, uh, NCCS Pune will be uh, giving a wonderful talk on microbial genomics. So uh, I request all the participants to join at 3 p.m. sharp so that we can, we can start the session in time. Thank you and see you later. Thank you.
afternoon one and all so welcome to the second half uh, session three today so uh, now uh, we have one more session for the day and uh, now i'm going to go to rajveer and take over the next yes sir so am i audible yes you are audible yes okay thank you sir so good afternoon everyone uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker uh, dr avinash sharma who is going to give a talk on uh, microbial genomics uh, dr avinash is currently a dbt welcome trust fellow at uh, nccs pune uh, dr avinash did his uh, bsc in uh, biology from university of jammu and then uh, msc in biotechnology in uh, 2006 from uh, hnb gadwal university srinagar then dr avinash completed his uh, phd in uh, microbiology uh, in 2013 from gb pant national institute of himalayan uh, environment and development uttarakhand uh, dr avinash has extensively worked on understanding the archaeal and bacterial commu uh, communities from uh, various extreme environments using modern techniques in uh, microbial genomics Uh, recently in 2019 uh, sir visited uh, antarctica to carry out his research project on a specific adaptation of previously unknown psychrophilic uh, prokaryotes from uh, antarctic uh, environment uh, then sir also served as a curator of uh, international uh, depository authority at nccs pune for about 8 years uh, he was a visiting scientist uh, in sir dfg in 2018 Uh, at Bute University of Applied Science Germany uh, sir was awarded as a fellow of society for environment and development india and also a young scientist award in uh, environmental microbiology by the association of microbiologists of india so please join me in uh, welcoming dr avinash sharma over to you sir thank you very much um, i hope i am audible sir Am I audible? Do you? Hello. Yes, Dr. Vinash, you are audible. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you very much uh, for for inviting me uh, for a talk, and uh, like you said that. Um, I worked on extreme environment, but um, unfortunately, I won't be able to give you a glimpse of those extremophilic microorganisms uh, from polar regions, um, because I have decided to, you know, compile this presentation in such a way that I can give you a glimpse of uh, modern microbial genomics as well as uh, a bit of our data how how microbial genomics is very very important, and also how this uh, microbial con. Um, um, conservation is is also a part of this presentation why is it important and what are the what are the roles of a particular microbial repository uh, in in uh, such uh, uh, environment so uh, i will share my presentation here you can see my presentation right yes yes we can see it yes yeah so once again yeah so today i'll be talking about uh, um the from from conventional cultivation you know uh, from cultivation of microorganism from single cell and then identification to the present era where we are with a lot of high throughput sequencing data which we are generating uh, to understand the microbial diversity from different ecosystem not just from the ecosystem but from humans from animals and from a lot more things so i will come to those point later on uh, and uh, in with uh, yeah so uh, the tree of life consists of um, i hope you all are aware that it, it consists of bacteria archaea and eukaryote so my domain is uh, bacteria and archaea 
uh, where I am working on. So, um, and and they belong to pro prokaryotes, and uh, these prokaryotes are early forms of life, and they have appeared on life around four billion years ago. And uh, if you see, uh, if you ask a simple question, why do we need to uh, know about the microbial diversity or microbes uh, because they are not even, you know, uh, visible to our naked eyes. So I just want to give you a brief um, uh, contribution of these tiny microorganisms for day-to-day -day life and how much they contribute to the, you know, ecological balancing and also they have a huge role in the production of many secondary metabolites. So they have a lot of uh, uh, um, importance in, in fermentation food if you can see um, earlier in india the very ancient india where people the tribal population specifically used to and still they used to ferment their food and eat this uh, particular uh, food which is you know uh, converted into fermentation using fermentation processes to a particular product so this is how these microorganisms function and and if you see they they just don't function in, in food or environment or um, or just um, ecological balancing, but, but they have a huge role uh, in, you know, uh, human body, animal body. If you have heard about human microbiome, I will also give you a brief introduction about uh, what microbiome is. And uh, uh, I believe that um, most of you be PhD students, so you will get an idea that what kind of microbiome studies are going on. What is the, what are the career opportunities in, in this particular field? So this is the overall picture of how this microorganism are inter connected with each and every sector uh, where we can see like from the medical industry to the ecology uh, to aquatic environment to human health to food etc so if you see um, how it started how the, how the how this microbiology actually started and how it came to this particular uh, situation other a particular position where we are at the moment so if you see in 1973 there is a bacterium uh, which was observed a single cell shape uh, uh, cell was observed by the uh, anthony van Leeuwenhoek, and it was named like they, they call it as animal uh, uh, cules because uh, it, it was resembling to uh, somehow uh, the, the cell so that's how it started and and see um, slowly slowly that the, uh, the area of this microbiology started developing and people have developed so many media which we use to cultivate this microorganism uh, because you might be aware that majority of these microorganisms which we have in a particular ecosystem or in a particular sample we we can't culture them all so for them uh, we need to develop different kind of media mimic, mimic dif different kind of substrate um, like in case of uh, any environment which is very high or uh, rich in uh, iron uh, so there might be a possibility that my, there might be bacteria which are degrading or utilizing that iron so we have to mimic the media in such a way that uh, we can provide at least uh, to certain extent, the environmental condition to, to these particular uh, uh, microorganisms. So that's how it started. And um, in between, there were many discoveries, and there were many cells which were discovered, many bacteria which were discovered, many many um, media which were discovered to you know uh, cultivate this microorganism. And also in this era, there were many discoveries which came out of these particular. Uh, you know microorganism like from the very beginning penicillin uh, to the tag polymerase we have uh, we are using in the pcr reaction so this is how it started in 1673 and uh, today in 2021 we have a lot of uh, a lot of lot, lot and lot of um, uh, products from from the ecosystem but the problem here is um like you see evolution of culture is although we have cultured so many bacteria but still we have 99 percent of the microbial diversity which is yet not cultured so you ask me what are the microbial identification method i'll, I'll go to this first and then come back to what what happens to the 99 percent of the microbial diversity so uh, if you ask me uh, if you have worked in a simple microbiology lab in a basic microbiology lab uh, where all these um, isolation and then identification is happening so you you take a sample and then you you know plate it on on different media and then you have cells you purify it 
and then you have like different kind of um, classification method based on which you can uh, not just classify but also identify uh, like in case of um, morphology biochemical tests you can also perform for some of the um, and these microorganisms like mild data of based uh, identification the microscopic based identification so all these you know uh, the bible of these microorganisms which is called as Burgess manual has all these you know characteristics which you can compare and then uh, then find out that what kind of microorganism this is but the problem is uh, every every methodology we discover uh, is is advancement but uh, down the line it shows uh, some of the drawbacks so in case of morphological there, there are drawbacks because there are majority of the organism which show like similar kind of morphology and there are also microorganisms which are different but show similar kind of uh, cell structure under under microscope and if you talk about maldi maldi has another drawback that it cannot uh, identify the environmental sample very well because of the lack of the database and um, then there there are molecular methods like sequencing which is which is known as the most reliable uh, uh, methodology for the identification of microorganism so a simple um, graphical abstract i'm showing you here if you can see i've already told you that you take a sample uh, you put it in the plate you dilute it uh, um, pour some media over the sample which you have added in in this battery plate and then you allow the media for solidification um, when you have added agar so after that you keep it uh, keep that plate in 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 this uh, particular incubator where you have a specific temperature so how you decide temperature is is based on from where you have collected sample like in case of antarctica where temperature is in minus so i used to grow my uh, organism at 4 degree because 4 degrees the uh, um, is, is the temperature where majority of the cyclophiles they grow and um, it's easy to grow these organisms at four degree so likewise if you are collecting samples from human uh, human feces or human uh, tissue or, or human skin so you have to keep like 37 degree temperature because the body temperature of human is 37 so the majority of the microorganism will be comfortable growing at 37 and then you have this plate which have you can see uh, different kind of colonies and then you pure purify these colonies and then you go for identification so like i told you there are many ways you can identify microorganism but uh, sequencing is one of such thing uh, which is very very reliable which gives you more in-depth knowledge and more you know um, curation of that particular data and also it provides you very very uh, generous um, uh, classification within the group of microorganism uh, so if you ask uh, me that um, okay fine we do sequencing but we have to focus on a specific gene uh, for the identification of microorganism because we cannot sequence everything we cannot sequence um, the whole genome just for the identification because it's it's expensive uh, so for that case um, it started with the 16s r RNA gene sequencing i will not get, go into detail because i think most of you are aware of that it's it's a molecular chronometer which is basically a housekeeping gene and it's a very stable gene it is present in all the bacteria and uh, it has it has a stretch of approximately 1500 and which is good enough to you know uh, solve the purpose of te taxonomic affiliation within the neighbors um, so and, and there is no change in the function of this particular gene since this is a housekeeping stable gene and it has a nine variable and uh, and the conserved reasons as well which are marked as variable v1 to v9 and um, uh, the, this is these are the just the uh, location of the base pairs and and the number of uh, base pair up till uh, variable nine region so how to do sequencing here um so uh, once i i show you the plate you have a mixed plate there and you have different colonies over there so now you will pick co each colony which are of you know different shape and assume that this particular colony which is showing different characteristics morphologically is a different different kind of bacteria so you take that um, colony and then again um, grow it on the similar same media which you have uh, used for the for the isolation of mixed population from the sample and then you go for the dna extraction and after dna extraction you 
you do PCR, uh, amplify that particular gene, and then you will be having these kind of electrophorogram, which are which will come from the Sanger sequencing. And uh, I'm sure you all are aware of Sanger sequencing. If not, then read a bit about it. It's very simple technique. Uh, so for this particular sequencing of a single pure culture, what we need is PCR uh, for for the amplification of a specific gene. And then, uh, of course, sequencer is required for that. And then for uh, for the editing of sequences uh, for that particular raw data which we have, we need software. So generally, we use um, uh, in our uh, lab, uh, um, Chromas Pro. We use we also use Star, and um, uh, we after that. Uh, we need to go for the bioinformatic analysis the, because the purpose of this sequencing is to identify bacteria. So when you do the bioinformatic analysis, when you construct tree, it is very, very important to have a database because if you don't have a reference tree, you can't identify a particular sequence. So for that, there are, there are a lot of databases available these days for the bacteria and archaea like green genes, silva, uh, BZ taxon, and um, also uh, NCBI also gives a lot of data. Uh, but mostly we use is it uh, is it uh, taxon because uh, it, it is reliable and it it belongs to all the taxon uh, all the types strain which have been published so far which are uh, valid strains uh, published so far. Uh, so this is how we do sequencing and this is how uh, we can identify um, a particular organism. So now uh, what. And the problem is um, you have taken a sample, you have grown it on a plate, you have different colonies, you have separated the colonies, you have pure culture. But you must be very curious to know that have we captured everything we have collected from uh, a particular environment? Suppose you have one gram of soil sample, and if you are putting it on a petri plate, do you think you are culturing everything over there? So the answer is no. You cannot culture everything on a plate on a media, because here the problem is you are collecting a sample from the environment and then putting it on a plate where you are unable to give all the micro and macronutrients which are responsible for the growth of a particular um, cell or, or the whole community which is present there. So if you see here, I have a bunch of um, cells here which I can see under the microscope. But if you see on a plate, I can only see one colony. So here in, in this case, um, since you know human beings are very curious and they, they are also demanding for more and more uh, innovation. So what about the remaining cells which are there, which we cannot culture, why they are not going on the on the on the plate. So what kind of microbes these uh, are? So these are the questions which come to mind. So if you see majority of, of the microorganisms are still silent and they are untapped and there, there are a lot of opportunities which you can grab and culture these microorganisms using different technologies. There are many technologies. We are also working on some of those technologies like single cell genomics. We are also doing um i chip cultivation uh, hanging drop method we are also doing uh, we are also creating a natural environment in the chamber and then you know giving all those micro and macronutrient to the to the uh, plate and then trying to grow but still it is very very difficult to culture all the microorganism and all these techniques which which i am telling you are very expensive and also uh, very time taking if you go for single cell genomics and if you want to do genome of all the cells which are present there uh, it it will take you years to finish off that so assume if you have one gram soil and four thousand bacterial cell and you are sequencing one four thousand sequences uh, different cells uh, just to identify doesn't make any sense so what happened before i go next level of sequencing so here uh, we have done one study in Sambar Lake where we have done cultivation of some of the microorganism. Why I am putting this slide right in between um, the next um, high throughput sequencing and, and the cultivation drawbacks is because what we have observed in this particular study is uh, uh, when you collect samples and bring it to the laboratory, um, you lose many cells. This cell 
um, there, there's there's loss of cell viability because you are collecting sample, you are bringing into laboratory, and by the time you are not able to give any um, substrate for utilizing this particular uh, microorganism, you you lose those cells because there are many organisms which are very fast growing, and they need some some media to to utilize uh, substrate and and perform their functionality so here what we did is we did on-site cultivation we took all the media on site we took sample and put it in the media on the different uh, different media we we collected from our lab and took there um, and then uh, we also performed one study which we where we collected sample from from the ecosystem and bring it bring it to the laboratory and perform the same sort of um, analysis uh, sort of uh, cultivation after two days because from Sambar to Pune we we took almost two days to reach and start our processing and what we observe here is uh, there were 10 different kind of genus which were you know uh, common in both on-site and laboratory uh, experiment but if you see there were seven different kind of genus which were only cultured in case of on-site cultivation so if you go here and these are the 12 different kind of microorganisms which we could capture using this on-site cultivation approach which we were unable to culture in in the different in the other approach which we use in cultivation so here the point was to know whether the, there is an impact of you know delay in sample processing yes there is a delay in sample processing there is an impact of and delay in sample processing on on cultivation of microbial diversity because um, if you delay you lose cell viability and if you lose cell viability there are many microorganisms which are not growing well so if you see on the right side here the, the percentage similarity it is less than 97 percent so it shows that all these microorganisms are novel microorganisms and among these two mi microorganisms we have already discovered two microorganisms and published them in, in in journals in different journals so the take home message from this particular study is it is it is very very important to use multi omics approach it is very very important to use diverse cultivation approaches on site cultivation and then you can also give specific media enrichment to capture majority of the microorganism so that's how it started and that's how we ended up uh, cultivating uh, so many novel microorganisms. And then, uh, yeah, so sequencing technology has evolved from first generation to third generation where we are at the moment. And, and if you see from the Sanger sequencing, uh, we used to uh, do pur purification of culture and then go for the sequencing and we used to get a bit of knowledge about what kind of microbes are there and there was there was a there was a huge gap between the whole community which is present there and what we can culture and then came the next generation sequencing compact pgm sequencer also and we also know what is using MySeq, and then now we have this nanopore and uh, smrt by pacific bioscience so these are the technologies which has which are evolved and how they have evolved, what they have done, what what extreme uh, um, knowledge they have uh, improved so far. The microbial genomics is concerned. I will come to the next slide. So before that, I'll I'll tell you what kind of if if we are relying on a particular technology, why we should rely on that technology, and it should ideally be uh, a very fast technology, accurate. And of course, it should be accurate. And this particular technology should be very easy to operate. It should not be very complicated. And protein, which is very important, funding is a major issue in research. So it should be cost effective. So, solution of sequencing, like I was telling you, from the first generation to the third generation, where we are now. If you if you remember, uh, there was a there was a project which was started way back in 90s somewhere where this human microbiome um, uh, sorry the human genome project was started and if you see in 1980 1985 1999 we could only generate 25 to 50 kb of data per year imagine 
uh, how how um, where we were at that moment. And if you see in 2020 and 2021, we can generate 300 GB of data simply by performing one simple run. So this is how the evolution of sequencing has has uh, reached here at this moment where we can do um, in depth um, sequencing of a particular sample. So coming to next, um, um, these are different platforms which I was telling you, and this these are the chemistry. So I I will not keep into uh, go into the details of these uh, platforms because you can read it. Uh, they are very uh, freely available. Um, so, like I told you, that it's very, very important to have a cost-effective. If you see here, uh, the fourth one, the cost-effectiveness is very, very important. So, um, I was telling you that I hope you remember there was a, a human um, a genome project which started, and it took around hundred million dollars to map one genome, one human genome in 2001 and if you come here uh, to be very specific today if we want to sequence 0.1 kb uh, or 0.01 kb data or 0.01 base pair it hardly uh, or one base pair it hardly takes 0.01 dollar to sequence that uh, base so if you see here uh, the sequencing cost has drastically reduced here. Uh, I just kept it till 2019, but it has reduced significantly down to $1,000 for a genome sequencing. So I, I still remember when, when I was doing PhD and I, I, I outsourced my uh, one, of the, one of the genome sequencing to, to, uh, in, to an uh, industry. And they charged me around 55,000 uh, rupees um, in 2013 14, I guess. And now we have our in house machine, and it costs us roughly around four to four to five thousand rupees for doing one draft genome sequencing. So, this is how evolution and cost of. Uh, of the sequencing has reduced down. It's not about the genome sequencing, but also if you look at the third generation, the high throughput sequencing, it has significantly reduced down. Um, now we can sequence um, one one particular sample and if we have very, very good data, like in 2000 rupees or 2500 rupees. So I, I have told you about sequencing thing how it has evolved what are the importance of sequencing and now i'll tell you where we have implemented this sequencing technology and what kind of data we have generated and what were the drawbacks of conventional cultivation technology all those comparative analysis i'll i'll show you here this is one of the paper which we have written based on our mass gathering study which we have performed so basically the mass gatherings are the gatherings uh, for example you might be aware of the Kumbh Mela is one one such mass gathering. Olympics is one such gathering. Any gathering, uh, social gathering, religious gathering, a sports event is 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 a mass gathering. And you might have heard about Hajj as well. People go for um, go to Saudi Arabia for Hajj, Hajj as well. So all these uh, mass gathering events uh, are are a source of you know spread of infectious disease. And there is some um, some experiment we have performed on the Kumela. But before that, I just want to give you a brief um, insight into the mass gathering event. So mass gathering event, like I told you, and um, if you see, Kumela is is known as the one of the largest mass gathering on the earth. In 2013, Kumela in Allahabad, 120 million pilgrims attended this particular uh, Kumela, which makes it the most uh, um huge uh, mass gathering on earth so far so it's it's basically a pilgrimage and it held on four different uh, um rivers um, um, banks of the river and it is celebrated every three and three or four years and it, it's the largest uh, recurring human mass gathering event um, as estimated 70 million pilgrims in 2019, but I told you it was 120 million in 2015, uh, 2013, sorry. 
So at the Kumila bearing in the uh, Holy River leads to microbial contamination and shift of the microbial, uh, sorry, it's, it's not microbial biome, it's microbiome of the rivers. So mass gathering event, of course, when there's a huge uh, gathering, um, you don't have much control and you also have a lot of other issues like sanitation is one such issue. Um, and then um, sanitation hygiene and then open and um, defecation, uh, all such things. And then going to the river and bathing is also, you know, um, putting back the uh, uh, microbes which are associated to your skin into, into the river. So these are um, mass gathering events or religious music sports, social gatherings, I, I already told you. And there are challenges like natural disasters, stampedes, they, they do happen in, in, you might have heard about uh, Kum Mela, Hajj as well, there are stampedes where there are a lot of um, deaths and accommodation is one such problem because for such a huge crowd, it's very, very difficult to uh, pro uh, provide accommodation and transportation, water supply, medical facility, and to, to maintain the you know, river uh, and environment around that particular event is also one such very challenging job. And there are also reports of terrorist att attacks, hygiene is one such thing I have uh, told you. And then infectious disease transmission and surveillance is, is very, very important. Um, in case of Hajj, I will say that there are there are a lot of data which have been developed um, because it's it's a very organized event. Uh, so you have to go there, you have registration and everything. But in case of Kumela, and there's no registration required, so you can simply go and take a shower and um, uh, go back. So and this is uh, these are some of the you know disasters which have happened over the past in case of Hajj in 2015 in Hajj 769 pilgrims were were dead because of the stampede and um, likewise there are, there are many such incidents and if you see there are, the current priorities of infectious concern in case of Hajj there is a, there is a huge debate on the spread of uh, tuberculosis uh, during Hajj um, and also um, AMR is one such uh, such event and like in you know you are very well aware of uh, coronavirus which is spreading all across the globe um, so these these kind of viral and uh, bacterial transmissions are, are very very uh, important to note on the surveillance is very very important to note on and there are many gaps in understanding the uh, pathogens which are associated because um, we generally go there but um, these are some of the things which require a lot of data uh, to generate so that uh, we can avoid pandemic and we can avoid epidemic or something which is going to happen there by having a vast knowledge of the data from such mass gathering event. So um, here we have done some um, collection of sample and then we did screening of some of the bacteria and then we did high throughput sequencing data and also bioinformatic analysis. So I'll just give you um, um, location here where we did two samples from upstream and three samples from downstream to look in, into uh, onto the microbial diversity before and during the Kumela. And luckily, we were. I should not say that pandemic is a, is something which we should feel that we were lucky. But uh, because of the lockdown, we were able to collect some of the sample during the lockdown also to have a comparative analysis whether the, when there is complete restriction on bathing, what kind of microbes are there. So I'll show you all the data analysis which we have performed. These are all culture-based data which we throw on the plate and then you know, uh, sequence and identify that. So if you see, we have different kind of microorganism there. Kakuria was very, very significantly high in case of uh, the mass bathing event, um, before the mass bathing event. And here, if you see uh, in case of um, fungi, there is also a different kind of structure, the composition structure of uh, microorganism there. If you see Aspergillus in case of before the micro uh, the, the event, it was less, but in case of during, it was higher than what we noted in 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 the before uh, Kumela. And also in case of microorganism here, the bacteria, 
um, Bacillus was the most uh, dominating group here. Um, yeah, the Brevendimonas was the most dominating group here, and then the Micrococcus was also present there. So these all are uh, the group of organisms which we reported. And we also uh, did some of the uh, screening for different antibiotic resistance because antibiotic resistance is also a global concern. And surveillance of such microorganisms is very, very important because um, India is, is one such country which is using, I will not say using, but overusing antimicro antibiotics. And uh, there is there is a lot of concern about the uh, you know development of antibiotic resistance against the last resort antibiotics like like colistine. So here we isolated some of the Staphylococcus um, uh, strains. And we found that um, these PRF15 and PRF404 strains here, um, this one and this one, uh, were sensitive against 18 out of 22 antibiotics. But these uh, three isolates uh, belonging to genus Acinetobacter, Corinibacterium, and Brevibacterium were found to be the most resistant bacteria um, organism against all these. Um, antibiotics. And if you see this cholestine here is the last resort antibiotic which we give to the patient. But if you see there are microorganisms here which are showing antibiotic resistance against this particular uh, cholestine as well. And we have discovered one organism which is Corinibacterium and we named this bacterium on the name of Godavari River as Godavarinium. And uh, if you see these, these organisms are known for, um, you know, skin and uh, uh, other diseases like um, soft tissue ulcerins and all those and also urinary infections are also one such um, threat from these organisms. And in this case, I'll not go into detail the kind of analysis we have done to um, consider this as an old strain, um, but yeah, we have performed some of the very interesting study and we found that cifotexomene is one of the antibiotic uh, against which this bacterium showed uh, resistant and all the other other uh, species of this particular genus uh, have not uh, shown such a broad spectrum antibiotic resistance especially the against the cifotexomene so this is what we have done and then we have also uh, isolated one more organism which we have discovered as chakrabartia godavrenia um, this was a new genus which we have discovered from, from this study. So we were more interested in it before doing, and um, luckily, like I said, that we got the sample from lockdown as well. So we were more interested to look into the, you know, uh, profiling of these microorganisms since cultivation uh, of microorganisms has drawbacks. So we went for this high throughput sequencing analysis. And here, if you see, Different uh, phylum uh, in case of the before event, before the event, they were higher in number. But if you come here in case of firmicutes, which are known as the as the uh, member of uh, human feces and also associated with skin sample, so these were uh, quite higher compared to uh, the other scenario we have here like the other phylums which are showing very higher abundance compared to firmicutes. So we were quite surprised to see that uh, it should be um, a higher number of copy number and it should be, a, you know, very vast kind of uh, uh, community composition, microbial diversity composition in case of the event which we which is happening because a lot of uh, skin microflora is also introducing into the, into the river and it should be quite uh, diverse. So to check whether these results are really fine uh, or they, there is some problem with that, so we did the picture quantification of these samples and we found that during the samples and uh, the hypothesis was right that there should be more number of copy number of uh, the microorganisms which are present there. So here we confirmed it using six, uh, the PCR based quantification. And if you are more interested, uh, you know, uh, one second, yeah. So we are more interested to know from where these microorganisms are coming because it is very, very important to know whether they are the actual member of the ecosystem or they they are coming from uh, from from a different source. 
so we did this source tracking analysis this is a uh, this is done by one of my students and uh, we found that uh, as of the four sample if you see the human skin samples are also associated with it but if you see in the during samples in case of the samples which are on mass bearing sites these last three sites which are mass bearing site there is a lot of differences and there are a lot of introduction of human skin samples except the upstream sample because these are taken from from the upper stream side where there is less bathing compared to these mass bathing sites and fortunately we were also able to uh, uh, check the um, uh, lockdown sample as well so here you can see th only three three samples because we was we were unable to collect sample from upstream site because of the lockdown so here if you see uh, after lockdown uh, during the lockdown, we collected sample and we found there was nothing uh, which was coming from human um, uh, human associated uh, samples. I mean, skin or oral or stool or anything. So we also did uh, functional potential of uh, uh, of infectious disease and drug resistance organism and we uh, class of drug resistance and we found that there were higher number of um, H. pylori infection related gene abundance was there. Staphylococcus uh, infection was also higher. Tuberculosis was also higher. And also there was there were organisms which were showing higher abundance of genes against this beta lactamase resistance, vancomycin resistance, and platinum uh, drug resistance uh, likewise. So uh, this shows that when there is mass breathing event, there is there are chances. There are higher abundance of these kind of genes which are associated to humans uh, uh, humans and also which are you know going into the into the natural ecosystem which can uh, further lead to the spread of these uh, particular genes into humans and also to the ecosystem and from that ecosystem it, it can further uh, go to uh, uh, to different animal and to human beings and we have also done um, a competitive analysis here uh, you you all are aware that during the kum mela uh, there, there is a lot of mass bathing but even if there is no mass uh, kum mela there there is mass bathing which is going on there uh, in that particular ecosystem so here we have three scenarios the one three three bars are showing before the kum mela sample and middle one is showing during the kumila and after the third one is showing the lockdown samples and here you can clearly see that it is being enriched by the verco uh, verco microbia and proteobacteria in case of the lockdown sample and which are known to be and bacteria it is also and these are the you know potential and a major member of a natural river ecosystem so this shows that even if there is there is a mass bathing or there is there is a uh, event there is a certain period if you keep the environment uh, less crowded or, or there is not major bathing the the ecological restoration is there so the restoration of the natural microbiota is there if there is restriction on on the mass bathing so um, this is this is again uh, something we did like I showed you earlier that before before the event the the H pylori infection was lesser than during but if you see in case of the lockdown it is much lesser than 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 the event or, or before the event. So this this was a story of uh, one of our study which we have performed long back in 2015 and the, then the part of the study which we have performed in 2020 where we could collect samples uh, during the lockdown and here i want to show you something interesting which which might be very interesting for the pg students so i did my phd in hot springs um, microbial ecology and also some of the biotechnological application like some of the enzyme we have purified and we worked on those enzyme to check the stability because um, the enzyme coming from extremophile are very stable because they are at extreme temperature so they stable they are stable at very high temperature so this is the geography of the spring from where we collected samples and uh, um, it, is, it is basically located in himalayan region of uttarakhand uh, and if you see here this is something which i wanted to show you the difference between a conventional cultivation 
and the high throughput sequencing. So if you see here, uh, using the cultivation approach, using 10 different kinds of media, we could only cultivate two different kinds of genera and 17 isolates were generated out of uh, this study. And then we also performed in between the high throughput sequencing, we used to you know, perform DGG, denatural gradient gel electrophoresis, and also the clone library construction. So I'll just give you a, a short description of these two technologies. In DGG, we run it on, run the uh, product, PCR product on, on a gel, and based on the weight of, um, the the band it will uh, disperse on the gel and then we take it and sequence those bands and in case of clone library construction we used to clone a particular specific gene in in the clones and then we used to sequence and look into the different kind of microbes which are present there so these were the technologies which are completely um, no one is using these technologies these days because they give you very less number of data so here, in case of second paper, on the same samples we used, we, we could only generate six genera from DGG and 22 species in library construction. So here we, we could uh, detect six genera. And if you see in the high throughput sequencing, the sequencing which you are, we are using as a third generation sequencing, the, the recent technology, uh, this was not even the recent technologies because it was uh, run on the... Uh, um, PGM uh, ion torrent machine and this also not give you very high throughput data but still if you can see there were 33 OTU this means that there were 33 different kind of um, genus which were present there in this particular uh, sample so you can here you can compare between 2 6 and 33 so this is how it has changed our our um, you know vision on on the presence of different kind of microbial communities in a particular ecosystem. Also, we a glimpse of human microbiome because our lab is also working on, on a lot of microbiome uh, studies. Um, so, one second. Yeah. So, uh, uh, of course, human microbiome, you might have heard about it. Uh, it's, it's a key to our health because uh, of this particular reason I'll show you. Before that, I'll show you why I uh, want to show human microbiome is we have recently performed one study on nasal microbiome where we collected the nasal microbiome samples and uh, we checked um, a comparative analysis between the healthy, uh, the non-infected and infected individuals. And we saw that in infected individuals, there was a lot of opportunistic pathogens which are in prevalence. Uh, in in very higher uh, higher abundance compared to the uh, co compared to the individual which were uh, not infected with the SARS CoV two infection, so uh, um, this uh, study I'm not going to discuss because we don't have much time to discuss this particular study. But this paper is uh, freely available online if you want to read. And if you have any question regarding this paper, uh, you can write me on on my email and we can discuss it further. Uh, so I just kept it to show you that how microbiome can also help you getting an information uh, on on the microbiome which is associated with with your with your um, nasopharyngeal and also um, how you know these sequencing technology can detect the prevalence of specific opportunity uh, pathogen and this this can give you a very good uh, information why there are uh, several secondary infections which are you know uh, coming in future uh, uh, in case of the infected patients and how how these pathogens can be one of those such secondary infection so if you see in case of human microbiome only uh, 30 percent uh, of the cells um, our body harbor, uh, but remaining 70% of the cells are the cells from, are, are the cells which are called microbial cells. So to give you more understanding on that, if you ask um, me, there are 20, um, 20 million genes in our body which are functioning, are coming from microbes and only 23,000 genes which are present there in our body are associated to our human cells. So you can imagine that how much functionality these microorganisms are performing in our body. 
So I'm not going to detail of this microbiome, but I just want to give you a glimpse so that you know that this kind of work is also going on and what kind of opportunities are there. So there are very big name in science who have like commented on the on the importance of human microbiome and one such um, um, person is uh, Rederberg who was Nobel laureate and then also Professor Julius, I, I hope you all are aware of uh, recambin and DNA technology uh, from Professor Julian and he also said that microbiome is something which is going to revolutionize the future and you might have heard when Obama was the president of US, he started an initiative, uh, the White House initiative, where he proposed to, you know, do the human microbiome and these are other funding agencies which are, you know, investing in this particular project. And if you see, India has also started one project and NCC is, is also part of this project and uh, we, we are also are also I'm not directly involved in this project, but uh, in our institution, people are doing sequencing human microbiome analysis of more than 30,000 individuals from different uh, ethnic groups. Not just the human microbiome because of the sequencing technology, the cost effectiveness and the, the high throughput data and high throughput information it gives. Um, it has also um, and the earth microbiome project has also been started to you know understand the functionality of these microorganisms for the sustainability of uh, agriculture and there are many start startups you can take your career further with uh, like Dano, Nestle um, who are investing in this microbiome uh, initiative and these are the in scenarios of the startup grants and if you see uh, majority of, of these papers or journals are very high impact journals they publish very high quality science like science cell nature so all these papers have cover page of human microbiome which itself shows that how microbiome and how much uh, in-depth uh, um, knowledge uh, it harbors the microbiome we have in our body. So before ending my talk, I also, I, whenever I give a talk, I generally talk about this particular repository because this is something which all of us should be aware of who are doing microbial and diversity research, and that microbial repositories are there across the globe and why they are there, the reason is because they are the permanent facilities and they have sufficient infrastructure for maintenance and preservation and they also have expertise in relevant areas so why do we need a permanent facility because i may retire tomorrow but the, the amount of biological data and the amount of bacteria i have produced during my research which are, which are having some potential should remain there in this facility so that someone else can use or else the money I have spent behind cultivation or, or generating this data or generating or, or cultivating or capturing these particular uh, cells is wastage. So that's why a permanent facility is important and sufficient infrastructure because if you're preserving it for long-term preservation, it should have infrastructure. And of course it should have expertise because if I'm doing this research, I'm not cultivating each and everything. If I'm working on archaea, I can cultivate a very few uh, archaea which I'm expert in. So a different kind of expertise is, are also available in this uh, particular repository. So I, I work in repository. I'm, I'm in charge of that repository. I wanted to bring this into your notice that why is it is advisable to preserve microorganisms? So you are well aware that microorganisms are genetically instable and can change in their property if you, you keep on subculturing them or subcultivating them. So that's that's the one reason. The other reason is microorganisms have to be available on a long-term basis with known specific and stable properties. So they should be available with specific properties uh, to, to the researchers. And one very important thing here is once lost, never recovered. So imagine there was a strain which was isolated from, from urine sample uh, somewhere in Europe, uh, the Streptococcus pneumoniae, 
strain d d40 i guess or d38 so imagine if we would have lost that particular strain if we would have not deposited that strain in the culture collection it, it it would have never worked for us as a as a model for uh, looking into the um, studies which are uh, relevant to the microbial based uh, analysis of uh, streptococcus pneumoniae so how important it is to have your organisms uh, in the repositories and when when you are starting a particular project um, it is quite possible that you miss that particular organism so that's why it is always good to keep these organism in, in a repository and whenever you require since these repositories have facilities for long-term preservation you can furnish these organism and you make sure that this is the same organism which we are using in this particular project so um, um, just, just some stats. Um, there are around 807 culture collection across the world. World, I'm talking about the microbial culture collection in 78 countries. India has 33 culture collection, and uh, we at uh, NCCS has the world's largest culture collection. I'll show you why. Um, so here, I'll go. Here, yeah. So we have around 2,000 isolates which were generated in 2009. There was a microbial mission project by DBT, uh, Department of Biotechnology, where uh, samples were collected from different ecosystem, and these are the isolate which were isolated in from where the genesis of NCMR National Center for Microbial Resource happened. And uh, and NCMR at the moment is um, is a project which was established in 2008. It has a status of International Depository Authority, uh, which means that uh, when you when you deposit a microorganism for patent procedure, you need not to submit it to each and every country for granting your patent. And it has also been designated as a national repository uh, by the MOEF. So why our culture collection is unique and, and a huge um, um, culture collection is because we have 1,80,000 cultures from the that project which I was showing you. And we have so far around 6,000 bacteria which were deposited by different depositors across the country, across the globe and 882 fun fungal culture were deposited and we also have around 260 patent deposit with us and we do perform different kind of services to industries and academia uh, this is the website of our uh, national micro uh, for microbial resource you can see here there are different kind of links which are given there like services you can opt for services what kind of services you are looking for, like identification of a particular microorganism, or you want to deposit a culture, or you want to purchase a culture, or you want to do genomics or metagenomics or genome analysis or something. So you can go here, see in the contact, write an email, and you will be assisted for that. So with this, I will end up with my talk with, with a thank to the director of NCCS who has given me liberty to do my work and uh, do with a passion. Dr. Yavesh Oche, who has um, been uh, my mentor, Dr. Kunal Jani, my student, who has recently joined um, in Prague as a postdoc. Um, sorry, <laughs> Sofnil Kajli is also a doctor now because he has recently defended his thesis and he is also um, looking for a postdoc position. And uh, there, are, there are many master students. I, I take a lot of master students for training and uh, they have also been um very important for us um, in contributing different uh, you know articles and of course uh, the research without funding is very very uh, difficult so dbt icmr india alliance and mas are highly acknowledged for uh, for their support for my research and this is the picture from antarctica the upper one the penguins and here are some of the icebergs and with this i would like to thank you for listening to me and thank you to all the committee members for inviting me for this talk and i'll be happy to answer if you have any question thank you thank you so much dr Vinash. it was very wonderful talk a lot of learning from your work so um, let me uh, ask if there are any questions from attendees so um, 
if you have questions, please, uh, I, we would prefer if you can write in the chat box. Yeah. Yeah, write in the chat box or you can directly call, uh, ask me. I'll be happy to answer. Okay, Pooja, Pooja, you can ask, you can unmute and ask questions if you like. Um, very good evening, sir. Uh, it was very enlightening lecture. So thank you so much. Sir, I have one query regarding while searching for the different microorganisms. So while screening for or to identify these uh, microorganisms, we have to look for the specific region. That is how we need to proceed. That I'm a bit confused, sir. Like we collect some sample and we are to identify how many microorganisms it is having. So then for after we have done the plating technique, then individual colonies we have, then we are to look yes. for each a uh, specific marker like idea sequence or such kind of things is it so yeah so uh, like you said ITS so ITS they it is for um, fungal oh. strains yes, and sir, yes, sir. we use 16s first uh, 16s use uh, is for the for the bacteria but you are right i mean it's a very good question so it's it's not um, you know uh, mandatory that every time you are using 16s or fungal um, the, the ITS region uh, is giving you a you know, complete taxonomic uh, affiliation because uh, there are several genera like Bacillus, Pseudomonas, um, Aromonas, they are, they are very complicated genera. And for that, yes, yes. apart from the 16 SRNA based data, you also have to generate some of the MLSE specific genes like housekeeping genes like RPOB, NIF gene, RPOD. So these yes, kind yes. of genes so that you know you have more robust data to delineate this particular organism and as a species level um, uh, 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 species level delineation from from the other uh, strains so but um, what 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 the point here is if you want to do the preliminary uh, preliminary um, identification of of any organism 16s or its are sufficient enough to give you a a good number of a, a huge amount of information and based on that information you can just further go ahead whether you want to go for the mlst or you want to go for the genome it depends on what kind of genus you have captured okay sir. Yeah. thank you so much uh, sir. so this uh, answer your question right yes sir yes sir definitely sir thank you thank you sir no problem Any other questions? Uh, okay, there is one question by Dr. Naresh. Can we use uh, 16 as ITS for identification of animal species also? Yeah, do they retain their sense in the sense of how do you un maintain their state when you reculture them from lab and research? ITS you can use for um, fungal most of the time because fungal for fungal ITS, um, fungal cultures we can use ITS but uh, not for animal because they are they are different uh, genes which are uh, um, required to uh, um, you know identify uh, animals so ITS is basically uh, for your um, fungal strain and likewise 16s is is for the bacteria so this is this is how uh, we identify but in case of animal or most of the plants will we use phytochrome b or something like that and the, the second question we have here the first question how do you maintain microbial bank you said you have more than lack microbial culture so we how we maintain culture um so we have this um you know uh, we sold stocks we also preserve it in in, in uh, liquid nitrogen uh, by you know uh, putting them in the glycerol stock and it has been observed that they can live for years and we do check the, uh, the, the viability of these organisms so this is how we preserve and we also do freeze drying uh, where we can keep samples for like five to ten years depending on which kind of microorganism it is 
and how to implement this data set with this informatics part um, i didn't get this question um, how to implement this data set which data set you mean here question number one from sabrano baral okay maybe you can write what what kind of uh, data set you will be uh, you are talking about and say if you have preserved AMR sample, do they retain their residence in? Yes, do they, they do retain. There is quite possibility for long term. That's why that's why we preserve it for long term preservation, just to avoid the uh, mutation in the cell. So it it is yes, it does because uh, if you see there are a lot of um, quality strains which are uh, which are there, which we are using for AMR based studies like Staphylococcus, like. Like Lepsila, so they, they they still have that broad range of uh, resistance against the antibiotics. This was the answer to question number two. How do you mean their native state when you culture them for lab? How do you un? Uh, what's yes, that? Uh, there was some uh, mistake in typing, sir. How do you maintain? Uh, so my question was, uh, say for example, you reculture it. So mm -hmm. if there is no selection pressure for these bacteria, which are resistant towards many, many antibiotics, mm -hmm. so when you are reculturing them and then uh, re retrieve them, so do mm -hmm. we, in the absence of selection pressure, will they still retain their native resistant? Uh... No, they have already procured it through horizontal gene transfer, right? Correct. So here they have the, the gene, they have that um, um, resistance already developed. So what we do is to reculture them. Mm -hmm. We don't need to give them any selective pressure. The only thing we need to give is the substrate on which they grow. Okay. So yeah. so as they the more generations come up, do they lose yeah. that uh, because of uh, any recombination? Like do they lose that resistance power? See, I have not seen uh, any such study which I performed, and I have also not performed any such study. But most likely, the 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 you know the horizontal gene transfer which has been inherited by a particular uh, organism uh, is is still considered as a broad spectrum pathogen. So I don't, I really don't know if because uh, because fraction of a fraction of this could have lo uh, lost, lost it, but okay. uh, it, it's very very difficult. It's it's very very because if yeah, but. It, this is this comes from uh, the simple uh, observation that when we have a transformed bacteria with dead resistance plasmate, uh, yeah. uh, if we don't uh, put tetracycline in the culture that we are uh, growing the bacteria in, slowly over yeah. a few generations, that will yeah. lose the plasmate. But yes, exactly. That's a valid question. When you do cloning, you also put some. Yeah. IGBT or something, you know, to enhance the growth, and you also have this gene of resistance, which is very, very important right. to grow these organs. But here in this case, they have already acquired naturally, uh -huh. right? So when they have acquired naturally, you have grown it from the ecosystem. That means you have already given them something uh, which they require for the growth. So they do, don't, don't really need a selective pressure or a specific pressure or specific resistance genes or, or any. Chemical composition of any uh, selective pressure which is required because they have acquired it in the environment. So the spread is basically in the environment where you have you know different like Bacillus X strain has um, polystyrene resistant gene and this is horizontally transferred to Pseudomonas. So they have acquired it in the natural ecosystem. Okay. Yeah. Fine, sir. Uh, one last question, sir. Uh, see now, as you said, AMR is such a global problem, and definitely it is a big problem within India also. So, yeah. and many of the antibiotics that we see in the market, they have been mm -hmm. discovered only in 60s, 70s, or 80s, right? Yeah. And there have been no new antibiotics coming into the market. So, mm -hmm. what is the scope of, uh, say, computer aided drug discovery on those lines? You have asked me of my future projects, so I, I should not disclose it, but still I also answer this question. Uh, so what happens is um, we are using synthetic biology and you know developing new product using already available peptides by modifications. So that's what your question is, right? 
that the pace of the discovery of antibiotic is very less compared to the pace of uh, resistance which we are developing against the antibiotics, yes, right? So, yeah. so, so what so, is happening is if you have seen over the last uh, uh, five, six years, I, I, I uh, hope you have seen this one paper and he's also my uh, supervisor in, in some fellowship. So he has discovered one antibiotic and that's how it started that the majority of the 99% which we cannot culture, we have to focus on that to develop, you know, um, to to look into their potential to new structure of uh, antimicrobials where we can also have um, antimicrobials Although yes. we are developing antimicrobial resistance, but we should have natural products from these organisms so that at least we have parallel race of yes. resistance as well as the new antimicrobials. Yeah, because I asked this question, uh, I am personally interested in trying to do use uh, my expertise in uh, computer aided drug discovery for it means like uh, discovery of some new compounds which could be uh, potential candidates as antibiotics. That was one thing where I'm working on that. That's where I wanted to ask you if you are, uh, if you are also moving in that direction, it would be nice to collaborate or something like that. Hello. Am I audible, sir? Dr. Naresh, thank you for your questions, Dr. Naresh. So you can uh, contact Dr. Avinash for any further interactions. Right, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Avinash, are you there? There seems some connectivity issue. Connectivity issue, sir. It's frozen, I think, sir. That's what. Yeah, so I can see one question from Mr. Sabal. So, um, can you clarify uh, your question because it's a very, um, very abstract kind of thing that you have put? Can we use bacterial data with computational technology? What what bacterial data are you referring to?
Can, can you hear me now? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, my internet got disconnected. So, so I, I was, I think, um, telling someone that, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very good field. It's a very good area. You should explore and um, discovering novel antimicrobial or any any secondary metabolites um, using different approaches is is something which is the future uh, of uh, of uh, combating the issue of not just AMR but different diseases. So Thanks. any any more question? Thank I you. actually the, the list of questions is 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 clear now for me because I have yes, logged yes. out. Correct. No problem. Thanks. Can you read me question for me? I can I can answer no problem. You have answered all the questions that were there in the chat box. So if okay. there are any further questions, please do write in chat box or you can raise your hand. Sir is still here. Uh, just again, sir. Uh, this is Dr. Naresh. Uh, so in future, possibly if there is any scope for uh, writing to you and collaborate on that uh, regarding drug discovery. So yes. we write to you and then we'll is it possible, sir? Yes, yes. We we are all open for um, uh, collaborations. So yes. just drop me an email anytime. We we will be happy. And if you have really very bright students uh, who want to do some uh, dissertation or something, please do apply through our online system, NCCS. Um, Certainly. So in yeah. fact, uh, our uh, one of my colleagues works on completely genomics of AMR bacteria. Okay. And we do have a super specialty hospital, which is a tertiary care hospital uh, within our campus. Okay. Uh, uh, we also get uh, pretty many AMR strains. And oh, wow, so a lot of publications come uh, out from uh, my. Uh, Dr. Dr. Naresh, right? Yes, sir. This is Dr. Yeah, Naresh. I also, I also request you to you know, deposit these culture to our culture collection because we do have AMR repository mm -hmm. and we are also planning to. Uh, have our own Indian standard strains for for quality uh, as a quality strains for for AMR related studies because okay. what we use here in India is is far more different from other countries because we have a lot of overuse of antibiotics. True, so sir. we are also True, working sir. on that. If you go to our website, you can also see that we are also working on AMR repository. So if you have really interesting strain uh, which you want to keep for long term preservation you can deposit with us but it's it's all up to you uh, yes, uh, in fact we got uh, my colleague got some elizabeth kingia strain oh, okay. and uh, this was quite resistant from uh, against many uh, antibiotics and even okay. carbapenem resistant and all that oh so, yeah carbapenem yeah it's it's a huge issue actually we are also getting some strains even from the natural ecosystem from marine ecosystem which are cholestine resistant so right. this is something and we are developing some database for this last resort antibiotic resistance and certainly yeah. sir. So it's a nice uh, nice uh, i think we have uh, um something common which we can work yes, together definitely yes. so this is my colleague is dr pradeep uh, okay. who is doing the genomics part and i am try trying to work on computer drug discovery and then uh, using the hitting some targets in the bacteria mm -hmm. so starting with uh, even uh, it could be the channels that is uh, efflux pumps or even efflux pump. Like, yeah, right. Exactly. Yes. Exactly, sir. So trying. And are you the, also are you also working on type four secretion or something? No, sir. No, sir. As of now, uh, okay. mainly annotation of genomes and then also mm -hmm. at the phylogenetics within that, and then uh, trying to see how there is uh, what is the mechanism of gaining resistance and all of that. So that okay. is uh, purely based on the genomics part. Mm -hmm. And okay. so we want to get into functional genomics and then try to get uh, uh, some a sort of like what could be causing the resistance in certain species like that. Sir. So that is also yeah. of our area. Basically, here. basically the, the spread of uh, um, and the, the gene transfer and other uh, mechanism yes, involved. True, yeah. sir. True, sir. That is what we are looking at. Yeah, definitely. I I am sure you have these um, platform for genome sequencing and all. But no, sir, genome, need... genome sequencing, we are doing it from, uh, uh, we are outsourcing it. Our institute okay. will say we don't have a genome sequencing facility, NGS. No, but if you uh, really have some interesting thing and we can collaborate and we can work on that, not a problem. You can invite me anytime. I think we can connect. I, I'll connect with you. Or in fact, uh, Dr. Vinod is, uh, Pankaj is also having my number. 
So, sure, sir. I will I will gather that from Pankaj. Sure, sure. Thank, Thank you, sir. Very really nice Thank listening you. to you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Okay. Any more question for me? Um, no, it does not appear that there any uh, question is left. So thank you, uh, Dr. Avinash. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Thank and, you. Thank uh, you very much. Yes, keep in touch with uh, all the participants who saw, saw is interested. Thank you so much. And for today, then uh, we are closing. Uh, so tomorrow we will have uh, day three of the workshop. We will have three sessions. First session will be uh, introduction to systems genomics by uh, Professor Pras and uh, from Amrita University. And the second session will be uh, a hands on on breast cancer prediction by uh, Mr. Arpit uh, from Insofi in Bangalore from industry. And the third session will be on translational models in neurology by Dr. Mukhraman. He is an assistant professor at University of Mines. So um, I hope you will all be joining for the these three exciting sessions tomorrow. So I look forward to all the participation of all of you. Thank you for joining today. And so we are closing today. That's all for today.